Computers, God help anyone who would try to get in the way of TBN, which was God's plan and his I have attended the funeral of these two people who tried. Hello. Somebody's attacking me because of something I'm teaching. Let me tell you something, brother. You watch it. And Adam is as much like God as you can get. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifested in the flesh. Jesus had a nice house, a big house. Jesus wore designer clothes. Jesus was handling big money. Now we know that sickness and disease is bound in heaven, so we can bind sickness and disease here. We know the blessings of God are loosed in heaven, and so we can loose the blessings of God here. You're supposed to be powerful. That's God's will for you. This is the first time you've had a full manifestation of that anointing. You got that? Boy, we're so, and somebody said, well, Jesus came as God. I mean, you know, the Bible says God never sleeps nor slumbers. And yet in the book of Mark, we see Jesus asleep in the back of the boat. Sometimes I wish God would give me a Holy Ghost machine gun, I'd blow your head off. In the first installment of this series, Joel Osteen, Origins and Errors of His Teaching, we focused on Osteen's heretical doctrines for the purpose of edifying Christ's people and helping those deceived by Him. In this second installment, we will examine the doctrines of the Word of Faith movement as a whole, since we only scratched the surface in the last film. The TV preachers who make up the Word of Faith movement have shaped the thinking of a lot of the world with respect to how Christianity is viewed. For a lot of people, the TV Word of Faith preachers represent Christianity. There have even been movies made about these preachers such as the 1992 movie Leap of Faith which follows the life of a corrupt TV preacher. This movement or religion helps to discredit Christianity in the minds of those searching for ultimate meaning in life. However, as this film will show, this fringe movement has nothing to do with historical biblical Christianity. Because this movement is so popular, finding its way into millions of homes through television, books and other media, and because it has such a broad influence on how Christianity is generally viewed by society, it is important to consider whether or not what this movement is teaching is consistent with orthodox biblical Christianity. Many people find the movement a bit strange, but have no idea just how heretical and diabolical it truly is. If it can be shown that this movement is actually an anti-Christian, unbiblical cult, which has nothing to do with biblical Christianity, then those deceived by such teachings must be informed. This ministry is 100% convinced that the Word of Faith movement is outside the Christian community because of the serious nature of its false teachings. Therefore, since Scripture exhorts Christians to point out doctrinal error for the sake of helping the people who sit under false teachers, that is the goal of this film. There have been many books written by responsible Christian leaders exposing and refuting the Word of Faith movement as an unbiblical heresy. The reason there are so many critiques and refutations of this movement is because a great number of people are concerned about its false teachings. Holy Scripture is very clear on the issue of pointing out the error of false religious leaders and teachers for the sake of helping people to not have anything to do with them. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them." Unquote. Titus 3.10, quote, A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, unquote. Hence, Holy Scripture fully sanctions refuting and rejecting false teachers. 2 Timothy 3.16 states, quote, All Scripture is breathed out by God, and profitable for teaching, 
for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness." Unquote. In this film, we will offer a biblical critique, a reproof, and correction to the Word of Faith movement since, after thorough study, this ministry has become fully persuaded that such people as Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Paul Crouch, Benny Hinn, Robert Tilton, Earl Polk, Morris Sorello, Charles Capps, and others completely and totally divorced themselves from anything which can be called Christian in the biblical sense. Since their following and influence is still around today and has been picked up by a new generation of Word of Faith teachers such as Creflo Dollar, Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer, Joseph Prince, Paula White, Casey Treat, T.D. Jakes and others, the doctrines of this erroneous movement must continue to be refuted biblically for the purpose of helping God's people. There are numerous warnings in Holy Scripture with respect to people within the church itself introducing heresies. The biblical writers were adamant and clear about being alert and having discernment when it comes to that. For example, 2 Peter 2.1 states, quote, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction." Unquote. One of the most alarming and damnable heresies of the Word of Faith movement is the Little God's Doctrine. John, come on up here. Come on, John Abanzini. One second. I want you to tell me what you hear the Spirit of God saying this morning. Tell me. What the Spirit of what God is saying. What you hear yesterday. the Spirit of God saying this morning. That is being declared in the earth today what the eternal purpose of God has been through the ages, and it's coming clearly now to God's people that he is duplicating himself in the earth. Amen. Amen. That he is duplicating himself in the earth. That he is duplicating himself in the earth. Say after me, within me is a God-man. Say it again. Within me is a God-man. Now let's say even better than that, let's say I am a God-man. When you say I'm a Christian, you're saying I am Mashiach in the Hebrew. I'm a little Messiah walking on earth, in other words. The new creation is just like God. May I say it like this? You are a little God on earth running around. Not only does Hin teach this heretical doctrine, but he also teaches that those who correct him will die and that their children will die. Let me say something else too, and I really don't care if you like this or not. You have attacked me, your children will pay for it. If you don't like it, it honestly don't matter with me. I am a little God. Yes. Yes. I have his name. I'm one with him. I'm in covenant relation. Yes. I am a little God. Critics, you are God. anything that he is. Yes. But if the Godhead gets together and say, let us make man, then what are they producing? They're producing gods. But I'm going to say to you right now, you are gods, little g. The quote-unquote grandfather of the Word of Faith movement, Kenneth Hagin, stated, quote, You are as much the incarnation of God as Jesus Christ was. Every man who has been born again is an incarnation, and Christianity is a miracle. The believer is as much an incarnation as was Jesus of Nazareth." Unquote. Earl Polk, who deemed himself a bishop, stated, quote, Adam and Eve were placed in the world as the seed and expression of God. Just as dogs have puppies and cats have kittens, so God has little gods. Until we comprehend that we are little gods and we begin to act like little gods, we cannot manifest the kingdom of God." Unquote. Where it's going to get big for some people. Get ready. Go, go ahead. Email me now in that place. Go ahead. You tap into who you really are. You know what the Bible calls you? It says you are little Elohim. You are a little God. You don't have a God in you. You are one. And you know, I was listening to a set of tapes by one man, and he explained it like this, and I think this kind of gets the point across. He said, you know, why do people have such a fit about 
God calling his creation, his creation, his man, not his whole creation, but his man, little gods. If he's God, what's he going to call them but the God kind? I mean, if you as a human being have a baby, you call it a human kind. If, if cattle has another cattle, they call it cattle kind. So, I mean, what's God supposed to call us? Doesn't the Bible say we're created in his image? You know, I've looked for one verse in the Bible. I just can't seem to find it. One verse that said, if you don't like him, kill him. I really wish I could find it. You're the children of the mother. How many of you are children of God? Oh, see, no, listen, listen. Nobody has problems saying, I'm a child of God. Everybody has problems saying, I'm a little G. Oh, everybody has problems saying, listen, now, 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 let's get down to it. Everybody got problems saying, I'm a God. Yeah. See, look at you, just had a problem. Oh. But I didn't say it. He said it. Kenneth Hagin states, quote, Man was created on terms of equality with God, and he could stand in God's presence without any consciousness of inferiority. God has made us as much like himself as possible. He made us the same class of being that he is himself, unquote. God came from heaven, became a man, made man into little gods, went back to heaven as a man, he faces the Father as a man. I face devils as the Son of God. Do you see what I'm talking about? He said, Benin, am I a little God? You're a son of God, aren't you? You're a child of God, aren't you? You're a daughter of God, aren't you? What, what else are you? Quit your nonsense. What else are you? If you say, I am, you're saying, I'm a part of him, right? Is he God? Are you his offspring? Are you his children? You can't be human. Word of Faith teacher Paul Crouch teaches that humans become part of the Trinity Godhead, quote, He, God, opens up that union of the very Godhead and brings us into it, unquote. The quote-unquote Bishop T.D. Jake states, quote, when God created Adam, he created him from the dust of the earth. God put his mouth on him, blew in him the breath of life. He became a living soul. God said, I wanted to see what I looked like, so I made you to be my image. You have my DNA. You are created out of me. You're a derivative of me, unquote. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. These teachings are all heretical, and they're contradicted by what the Bible clearly states. The most evil and diabolical statement of this nature was given by Casey Treat, who stated, quote, The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost had a conference, and they said, Let us make man an exact duplicate of us. Is that what the Bible says? Oh, I don't know about you, but that does turn my crank. An exact duplicate of God. Say it out loud. I'm an exact duplicate of God. The audience repeats it a bit tentatively. Come on, say it. He leads them in unison. I'm an exact duplicate of God. Say it again. I'm an exact duplicate of God. I'm an exact duplicate of God. Yell it out. Shout it out. When God looks in the mirror, he sees me. When I look in the mirror, I see God. Oh, hallelujah. You know, sometimes people say to me when they're mad and want to put me down, you just think you're a little God. Thank you. Hallelujah. You got that right. Who do you think you are? Jesus? Yep. Are you listening to me? Are you kids running around here acting like gods? Why not? God told me to. Since I'm an exact duplicate of God, I'm going to act like God." Unquote. Not only is every argument that these people use to support their theology erroneous, but there is so much biblical material which condemns their little God's teaching. We will first examine the biblical and historical case against this doctrine, and then refute their misuse and abuse of the few verses they appeal to in order to support their heretical teaching. The teaching that there is one God is called monotheism. Orthodox biblical Christianity has always affirmed this teaching. The teaching that there are many gods is called polytheism. 
Christianity has always rejected polytheism, pagan religions like Hinduism and non-Christian cults like Mormonism teach polytheism. Christianity doesn't. For example, Brigham Young, a leader of the Mormon cult, which teaches that Jesus and Satan are brothers and that salvation is by works, stated, quote, How many gods there? I do not know. But there never was a time when there were not gods and worlds, and when men were not passing through the same ordeals, mortality, that we are now passing through. That course has been from all eternity, and it is and will be to all eternity." Unquote. Now concerning the biblical evidence affirming that there is one God, we see the following in Isaiah 43.10, quote, Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me, unquote. The Hebrew word for God here is El, the singular form of the same word these word of faith teachers often erroneously attach to themselves, Elohim. Thus, according to the true God, these people who God created are not gods. Case closed. The third and fourth century Christian writer Arnobius argued, quote, when we converse with you on religion, we ask you to prove this, that there are other gods than the one supreme deity. There are some, besides, who assert that those who from being men became gods are denoted by this name, as Hercules, Romulus, Aculapius, Liber, Aeneas. These are all, as is clear, different opinions, and it cannot be, in the nature of things, that those who differ in opinion can be regarded as teachers of one truth." Unquote. Now, like 43.10, Isaiah 44, 6 and 8 states, quote, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me. Since I appointed an ancient people, let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any." Unquote. And Isaiah 45, 5 and 21, quote, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. Who told you this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me." Unquote. So you have the Word of Faith teachers, the pagan religions, and the Mormons teaching polytheism, that they are gods and can become gods, and then you have Holy Scripture, which is clear on the issue of monotheism, thereby refuting any attempt to make people out to be gods. This agreement between the Mormons and the Word of Faith movement is not surprising, however, since Word of Faith proponents have made comments such as this one by Earl Polk. Polk teaches that Mormons are, quote, brothers and sisters in the faith. For so long we have said, why don't the Mormons change? Perhaps we should be the ones to change, unquote. Word of Faith teachers like Polk would love nothing more than for Christians to accept heretical, polytheistic Mormon teaching. And what about Mitt Romney? And, and i got to ask you the question, because it is a question whether it should be or not in this campaign, is a Mormon a true Christian? Well, in my mind they are. Now Deuteronomy 6.4, which is called the Shema, states, quote, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, unquote. What this is literally saying in the Hebrew is that Yahweh is our Elohim, and Yahweh is one. The Elohim, or God of Christianity, is Yahweh, not anyone else. Yet, the Word of Faith teachers identify themselves as Elohim, based on a few misunderstood texts. In ancient times, God's people would recite this monotheistic formula every morning and evening. Now, the inspired Apostle Paul's comments surrounding the Christianized version of the Shema in 1 Corinthians 8 which shows that Jesus is part of the one God mentioned in Deuteronomy 6.4, refutes the Word of Faith movement, demonstrating that it is in serious error for teaching that people are gods. 1 Corinthians 8, 4-6 states, quote, Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, 
we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist." Unquote. Notice, Paul is teaching that although in their society and in the world there are many so-called gods in the pagan pantheons and on earth which people believed in, in reality there is no god but one. Those other gods are not real. In fact, Paul later goes on to say that these so-called gods of the pagan religions are just demons in 1 Corinthians 10.20 where he states, quote, what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God." Unquote. With respect to reality and truth, Paul identifies the God of the Deuteronomic Shema as the Father and the Lord of that same Shema as Jesus Christ, affirming that Jesus and the Father make up the one God of Deuteronomy 6.4. In essence, Paul split the Shema and identified the Lord of the Shema as Christ. The inspired Apostle Paul and the other biblical writers also teach that the Holy Spirit is part of the one God. So on the one hand, you have the inspired Apostle Paul teaching that even though people claim there are many gods, there is only one God in reality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that only this one God has the power to create and sustain. And on the other hand, you have this word of faith religion teaching that everyone is a God, and people have divine godlike power to create things into existence and sustain themselves with their words and thoughts. The contrast between the biblical reality and the word of faith deception is apparent. Christians in the early church recognized the significance of this passage with respect to monotheism, rejecting the idea that there are other gods besides the one true God. John Chrysostom, AD 347-407, the 4th century Archbishop of Constantinople stated, quote, They do not have any power, and they are not gods, but only stones and demons. For although they may be so-called gods, as indeed there are, not simply gods, but only so-called gods, since they are gods in word only, not in reality, Paul's argument has been directed against idolaters to show that for Christians, there is no multiplicity of gods, unquote. Although these people teach that humans are made in terms of quote-unquote equality with God or the same quote-unquote class of being as God as Hagen claims, the biblical view is quite different. For example, Jeremiah 10.6 states, quote, There is none like you, O Lord. You are great and your name is great in might, unquote. And with respect to the quote-unquote God class, Psalms 86.10 makes it quite clear that there is only one in it, quote, For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God, Elohim, unquote. This is a clear rejection of the heretical idea that men are exact duplicates of God or little gods. In Acts 10, 25-26, when Peter was allegedly born again and made a little god, he says something which destroys this heretic cult. Quote, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. Unquote. Notice, Peter wouldn't accept this customary bowing. Instead, he reminds Cornelius that he is merely a man. Another clear text which refutes the Word of Faith movement's little God teaching is Genesis 3, 4-5. In this text, God had just gotten through warning Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, lest they die. Then Satan, or the devil, said to Eve, quote, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil." Unquote. In verse 6, Eve, now deceived by this temptation of being as gods, ate from the tree along with her husband. This act of violating God's command 
then plunged humanity into sin to this day. The first one to teach that men shall be as gods was Satan himself. And yet the Word of Faith movement teaches that people are little gods, as if this is something coming from God. As the world religion and cult expert Walter Martin argued, quote, In Genesis 3.5, we can clearly see that the teaching that man is a god, or can become like God, in relation to the divine essence, originates not with God, but with Satan, who brought about the fall of man by deceiving Eve and then Adam into believing they would be like gods." Unquote. Therefore, when Word of Faith teachers like Earl Polk teach people that they need to, quote, begin to act like little gods, unquote, he is clearly tempting people with the same lie that Satan told Adam and Eve, that they can be like gods. This is totally heretical, according to the Bible, and condemned by the Christians in the early church. And I want to say to all you scribes, Pharisees, heresy hunters, all of you that are going around picking little bits of, of doctrinal error out of everybody's eyes and dividing the body of Christ and arguing over splinters and doctrinal hairs and, and dissipating and wasting all of our time when the world's going to hell, I say get out of God's way. Quit blocking God's bridges. For God's going to shoot you if I don't. For God's going to shoot you if I don't. Severian, 8380-408, to 408, argued that Genesis 3-5 proves that Satan invented polytheism, i.e., the belief in other gods besides the one God who exists, quote, See the devil's premeditated evil. He is already plotting to sow error in the world, and since he planned, as I said, to give rise to polytheism in the world, he began as if stating a fact by sowing in the woman's hearing the impression of there being many gods. While the architect of evil thus sowed the thought of gods, however, God in his foreknowledge took steps to ensure the future error not be uttered by a human mouth. His intention was that an utterance about gods not be the first rational statement, but a serpent's opening remark, so that every reference to idols be compared with the latter's." Unquote. Theophilus of Antioch, the second century church writer, argued along these same lines, quote, Through the serpent, error would introduce a number of gods which had no existence for there being but one God. Even then, error was striving to disseminate a multitude of gods, saying, Ye shall be as gods." Unquote. Now, one thing the cultists like to do is exalt man and lower God. That is, their theology exalts man to the level of deity, and it attempts to bring God down in terms of status or exaltation. For example, Paul Crouch and Kenneth Copeland state, quote, God doesn't even draw a distinction between himself and us, Kenneth Copeland, never, never. You never can do that in a covenant relationship, Kenneth Copeland. You are anything that he is, Paul Crouch, yes, unquote. Likewise, as previously quoted, Hagen tries to lower Christianity's God and Savior, Jesus Christ, by saying, quote, you are as much the incarnation of God as Jesus Christ was, unquote. Here Hagen attempts to lessen the uniqueness of Christ's incarnation and deity by elevating man to the level of Christ. Likewise, Kenneth Copeland tries to lower God the Father by foolishly claiming that God the Father is a six-foot man in his natural state. So you see, that faith didn't come billowing out of some giant monster somewhere. It came out of the heart of a being that is very uncanny the way he's very much like you and me. A being that stands somewhere around 6'2", six, 6'3", six, that weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple of hundred pounds, a little better, has a span of eight and, I mean, nine inches across, stood up and said, Light be! And this universe situated itself. Copeland also teaches that before God created the world, he was restricted to living on a planet. This is Mormon doctrine. This is all a copy. It's a copy of home. It's a copy of the mother planet. Where God lives, he made a little one just like his and put us on it. 
He teaches that heretical view because he claims heaven is actually a planet. Heaven has a north and a south and an east and a west. Consequently, it must be a planet. Moreover, the Crouches and Benny Hinn blaspheme God and exalt human wrath above that of God's wrath. It has been said here, which would you rather have, the wrath of God or the wrath of Jan? <laughs> A lot of people Everyone say God. Everyone agrees, I'll take the wrath of God. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Please don't yeah. take God. <laughs> Joseph Good goes so far as to try to strip Christ of his deity entirely and claim that he is not God. Yeshua we do not see as being God. When he walked here on earth, we see him as a man. A man anointed by God. A man anointed by God, sent by God to perform a function. Now, in his resurrection, he's not God. We do not see him as God. Now, there are two distinct figures in Holy Scripture who similarly wish to exalt themselves and man to Godhood while trying to bring down God in terms of exaltation, Satan and the Antichrist. This is where this particular Word of Faith teaching originates. For example, in Isaiah 14, 12 to 14, we are told why Satan was cast out of heaven in the first place, quote, How you are fallen from heaven, Lucifer, son of dawn, how you are cut down to the ground. You who laid the nations low, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High." Unquote. This text describes both the fall of the king of Babylon literally, as well as Satan's banishment from heaven symbolically. In Luke 10, 15, and 18, Jesus indicates this by alluding to Isaiah 14 and then mentioning Satan falling from heaven. He stated, quote, And you, Capernaum, Will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven." Unquote. Satan, as the first mighty angel, was banished from heaven due to pride. Isaiah 14 shows that he wished to set his throne on high and make himself like God, and was therefore kicked out of heaven. As Walter L. Liefeld notes in his commentary on Luke, quote, the taunt song described the fall of the king of Babylon, Isaiah 14, 4 11, and the fall of the morning star, Lucifer, to which Luke 10, 15 alludes, unquote. The early Christian writer Tertullian, AD 160 to 225, saw in Isaiah 14 a clear reference to Satan, demonstrating that this interpretation is not some later innovation, but is instead very ancient. He stated the following in his work Against Marcion, Book 5, quote, The devil who once said, as the prophet describes him, I will be like the Most High, I will exalt my throne in the clouds, unquote. And finally, the late first century Jewish text known as Second Enoch also understood Isaiah 14 to be referring to the fall of Satan, quote, Here Satanael with his angels was thrown down from the height, and one out of their order of angels, having turned away with the order that was under him, conceived an impossible thought to place his throne higher than the clouds above the earth, that he might become equal in rank to my God's power. And I threw him out from the height with his angels, and he was flying in the air continuously above the bottomless." Unquote. Hence, there is good biblical, historical, and scholarly support for the fact that according to Isaiah 14, Satan was kicked out of heaven for doing the very thing these Word of Faith teachers do, that is, exalting himself to the level of God and attempting to lower God's status or remove him from his rightful sovereign throne, an impossible foolish endeavor. When I read in the Bible where he says, I am, I just smile and say, yes, I am too. In another Old Testament text, namely Ezekiel 28.2, we read about how the Prince of Tyre literally, and Satan symbolically, attempt to set themselves up as gods, quote, Son of man, say to the Prince of Tyre, Thus says the Lord God, Because your heart is proud, and you have said, I am a god, I sit in the seat of the gods, in the heart of the seas, 
yet you are but a man and no God, though you make your heart like the heart of a God." Unquote. The context of Ezekiel 28, namely 12 to 28, has persuaded many throughout history that this text clearly refers to Satan. Notice God doesn't sanction this heretical idea that men can be gods, as the Word of Faith teachers suggest. Rather, claiming to be a god when you are a man or Satan is a result of having a proud heart. However, all of this information and all of these warnings don't stop the cultists from teaching people that they can be gods since, as Romans describes unregenerate man, quote, there is no fear of God before their eyes, unquote. In spite of this, Word of Faith proponents will not hesitate to say things such as this comment by Paul Bilheimer in his book Destined for the Throne, quote, Thus, through the new birth, and I speak reverently, we become the next of kin to the Trinity, a kind of extension of the Godhead. This group outranks all other orders of created beings, unquote. Commenting on the falsehood of such thinking, Walter Martin stated that, quote, such teaching puts man on the throne and makes him an extension of the Trinity. It is a serious error, therefore, to use such terms. Man is not now, and never can be, in God's class." Unquote. Now, I mentioned that how not only Satan attempts to elevate himself to the level of God and lower God's exaltation, but Antichrist does this as well. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3-4 states, quote, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called god or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God, unquote. Daniel 7.25 and 11.36-37 say something similar, quote, He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times and half a time. And the king shall do as he wills, and shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods, he shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all." Unquote. Like Satan, the Antichrist also seeks to be God, exalt himself above God, and attempt to lower God in exaltation. Therefore, it is quite clear by doing and teaching these same things, the Word of Faith teachers are mimicking the attitude and actions of Satan and the Antichrist, instead of faithfully teaching people true biblical doctrine. As John MacArthur stated in his work Charismatic Chaos, quote, God said to the rebellious Israelites, You turn things around. Shall the potter be considered as equal with the clay? Isaiah 29.16 According to the Word Faith Movement, the answer is yes, but according to Scripture, there is only one God, and besides Him there is no other." Unquote. I'm tired of scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, blocking God's bridges. Let Him sort out all this doctrinal doo-doo. I don't care about it. It is not Christianity which teaches that, as Copeland says, quote, you do not have a God in you, you are one." Unquote. It's false religions and cults which teach that. For example, an early heresy which Christianity combated was known as Gnosticism. Church historian J. N. D. Kelly notes that Gnostics believed in many gods. He mentions the, quote, Gnostics theory of a hierarchy of eons descending from an unknowable supreme God, unquote. Late Gnostic forgery texts found in Nag Hammadi, Egypt in 1945 espouse this little god heretic teaching. One such text is known as the Gospel of Philip, written between AD 150 and 300. 
and it presented an early heretical Gnostic view of human deification, quote, but you saw something of that place and you became those things. You saw the spirit, you became the spirit. You saw Christ, you became Christ. You saw the father, you shall become father. So in this place, you see everything and you do not see yourself. But in that place, you do see yourself, and what you see, you shall become. But one receives the unction of the power of the cross, this power the apostles called the right and the left, for this person is no longer a Christian, but a Christ." Unquote. When you say, I'm a Christian, you're saying, I am Mashiach in the Hebrew. I'm a little Messiah walking on earth, in other words. Another heretical Gnostic text known as the Sentences of Sextus stated, quote, A good man is the good work of God. A man who is worthy of God, he is God among men, unquote. And lastly, the Gnostic forgery known as the Gospel of Thomas states that Jesus allegedly said, quote, Whoever drinks from my mouth will become like me. I myself shall become he and the things that are hidden will be revealed to him." Unquote. The Oxford Companion to the Bible, edited by Bruce Metzger and Michael David Coogan, notes that according to Gnostics, quote, baptism was understood to be a rite of immortalization that deified its initiates. According to the Gnostics, if baptism initiated Christians into the death and resurrection of Christ, as Paul argued, then it also united them with Christ's ascension and enthronement, separating the baptized entirely from the mortal sphere." Unquote. Hence, word of faith theology is more in line with later Gnostic heresies than it is with the Bible. This word of faith teaching is also similar to the ancient pagan Greek concept of deification of men. In ancient Greek pagan religion, it was believed that heroes and exceptional men became gods or were deified celestially. As the Oxford Encyclopedia of Ancient Greece and Rome, Volume 1 states, quote, Greek mythology also features a few heroes, such as Heracles, who, upon death, were transformed into gods like the Olympians, unquote. But I'm going to say to you right now, you are gods, little g. Now, one would think that if the New Testament, for example, taught that men become gods, as the word of faith religion suggests, that the New Testament writers would say at least once that they were little gods. One would expect Paul in his letter to the Romans to say that he is a little god, a little theos in the Greek, or that the Roman Christians are little gods. One would expect Peter or James in their epistles to say that they are little gods, or that their Christian audience is comprised of little gods, little theoi in the Greek. But there is not one statement of that nature in the entire New Testament. The Word of Faith teachers emphatically repeat that they are little gods over and over. It is one of their major doctrines, yet not once does a New Testament author do that. All the Word of Faith movement has biblically are a few misunderstood texts taken out of context, which we will cover shortly. Now that we have provided a case for monotheism and against the Word of Faith Little God's heresy, it is time to address the few passages this movement misuses and abuses in order to promote their doctrine. The main text and argument centers on Genesis 1.26 which states, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, unquote. The argument here is that because man is made in the image of God, this must mean that God created little gods. The word of faith teachers understand the image of God to be in reference to being created divine in the God class with divine creative ability whereby one can speak things into existence like God and with sovereign divine power over our life and other things. See, when God created us in his image, he didn't put any strings on us, did he? Mm. He didn't make us puppet. No, he didn't not say at all. he didn't say, Marsh, raise your hand, raise your hand, no. you know, and here we are, we have no absolute no control over us. He made white hum. He made Mars a small, miniature God. Of everything produces after its own kind, we now see God producing man. 
And if dogs get together, they produce what? If cats get together, they produce what? But if the Godhead gets together and say, let us make man, then what are they producing? They're producing gods. Kenneth Copeland states that Adam was created, quote, in the God class. He was not subordinate to God even. Adam was walking as a God. What he said went. What he did counted. And when he bowed his knee to Satan and put Satan up above him, then there wasn't anything God could do about it because a God had placed Satan there, unquote. Notice first, Copeland's direct assault on God's omnipotence by saying God couldn't do anything and was basically helpless. This is totally heretical, and another example of exalting man and demoting God. Adam was a super being when God created him. I don't know whether people even know this, but he was the first superman that really ever lived. First of all, the scriptures declare clearly that he had dominion over the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, which means he used to fly. Whoa. Well, of course, how can you have dominion over the birds and not be able to do what they do? Whoa. Actually, I mean, the, wait a minute. Uh, wait. I'll prove it to you. Wait a minute, <laughs> Danny. I've never heard that. So I'll prove it further. Adam not only flew, he flew to space. He used to be, he, 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 he was with one thought, he'd be on the moon. There is no biblical basis for these strange claims about Adam. So now it must be asked, is this what Genesis 126 even means when it says that God created man in the image of God? The answer is no. This text has nothing to do with an exalted godlike status of man or man being in the divine God class. According to the immediate context, the surrounding context and the surrounding cultures, what is meant by man being made in the image of God is that man is an earthly representative of God, appointed as a lower vice-regent to govern the earth on God's behalf. That is to say, humans have been created with a natural jurisdiction over animals, plants, and things of this nature, and by governing the earth on God's behalf, we can be said to bear God's image as his created representatives. There is nothing about men being gods in a divine sense at all. The context reads, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so." Unquote. Genesis 1, 26-30 it is a large leap to assert that because we are representatives of God who received the blessing of having necessary dominion or rulership over food, plants and trees, etc., that this means, as the Word of Faith teachers claim, we are not subordinate to God, or that we are little gods equal to God, little I am's. That is totally heretical. In support of this proper understanding of men being made in the image of God, Old Testament scholar Gordon J. Winham states the following in his commentary on Genesis, quote, It is now known that it was widely held in the ancient Orient that the kings were the image of God, that is, that they were the God's representatives on earth and governed the earth on his behalf. This is clearly the idea here, with one great change, namely, that every human being, male and female, not just the king, is God's representative who governs the rest of creation on God's behalf. This is not a mandate to exploit the earth, but to manage the earth for the benefit of all creation. For kings in the ancient world were supposed to care for their subjects, not exploit them. Psalm 72, unquote. Because this movement has a very improper and low view of God and his right to be glorified uniquely and primarily, 
They do not hesitate to exalt man to God's level, thereby robbing God of the glory which he alone deserves. Another text which the Word of Faith movement distorts in order to teach that men are little gods is Exodus 4, 15 and 16, where God commissions Moses and Aaron in Egypt. It states, You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be a god to him." Unquote. However, this text doesn't say that Moses was created as a little god, or that he is a divine little god as to his nature or essence. It's teaching that in the context of this event, or at this point in time, Moses was to function as a god in delivering the divine message to Aaron, which Aaron would then deliver to the people. In other words, as the Hebrew and Semitic scholar Robert P. Gordon notes, quote, when they address the Israelites, Moses and Aaron will be in a relationship similar to that between God and his spokesmen, the prophets. Just like God's role is giving the divine message to the prophets, Moses' special role in this case will be to give Aaron the divine message from God. So in that sense, Moses would temporarily function as a God or like God to Aaron. That is all that this is talking about. It's simply an analogy. Exodus 4.16 has nothing to do with Moses' nature or ontology. It has to do with his momentary functionality at that particular situation in Egypt. This is the same case with Exodus 7.1 which states, I have made you a god to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet." Unquote. This has nothing to do with Moses' nature. We have already seen that according to Deuteronomy 6.4, Yahweh is our Elohim or God, no one else not Moses, and certainly not Paul Crouch or Benny Hinn. According to such texts as Isaiah 45.5, there is no God or Elohim which exists except Yahweh. Now, one of the most popular misused texts for this movement is Psalms 82, 2-7. It states, How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness, all the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are God, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men you shall die, and fall like any prince." Unquote. You tap into who you really are. You know what the Bible calls you? It says you are a little Elohim. You are a little God. Verse 5. The magistrates and judges know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in the darkness of complacent satisfaction. Now this is interesting. All the foundations of the earth, the fundamental principles upon which rest the administrations of justice are shaking. I was listening to a man teach this week, and he said that because people are not taking their proper places, because God's people are not taking their proper places, everything in the earth is out of balance. All the foundations that the earth is supposed to be built upon are shaking in this hour because God's people are not taking their proper places. Verse 6, I said you are God's. Since you judge on my behalf as my representatives, indeed all of you are children of the Most High. It is important that we know who we are and that we walk with that power consciousness. Although the Word of Faith proponents distort this text to mean that, as Copeland asserts, humans are little IMs, exact duplicates of God, as Treat says, part of the Godhead, as Crouch says, or simply little gods, as the others teach, that is not the sense of this text. That is not what these verses are even teaching. As Gerhard Kittel and Gerhard Frederick state in their Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, quote, the Old Testament basis for the description of humans as gods is slight, and in passages like Psalms 82.1, Exodus 21.6, the reference is to judges as God's representatives. The rabbis resist strongly the pagan pretensions of human deity, Daniel 11, 36-37. Where the Old Testament calls heavenly beings Elohim, the LXX usually has angels or sons of God. This is part of the great polemic against the idea that the idols of paganism are gods in any true sense." Unquote. 
In Psalm 82, God is criticizing earthly judges who were given much power and responsibility to care for the people, dispensing judgment and justice, and were thus called Mighty Ones or Elohim. They were governing the earth on God's behalf, and therefore, when they're called gods, it's simply an analogy for their function. They're not actual gods as to their nature, as the Word of Faith movement erroneously suggests. When Elohim is used in the divine sense to refer to the one true God, that sense is never shared with anyone else, especially not humans. We can deduce this from many passages which were already covered, but 2 Samuel 7.22, for example, states that, quote, Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, and there is no God, Elohim, besides you, unquote. When Elohim is used in the divine sense to refer to deity, no one else gets to have that meaning attached to them. Therefore, it is erroneous to appeal to the fact that humans are called Elohim as an analogy in Psalm 82 in order to try to prove that they are actually little gods as to their nature. Now, when Jesus in John 10, 32-36 cites Psalms 82 to refute the Jewish rulers, this doesn't prove the word of faith little gods doctrine either. The text states, quote, Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, You are blaspheming, because I said I am the Son of God? Unquote. And Jesus answered, Is it not written in your law? I said, You are gods. Little g. So men are called gods by the law, men to whom God's message came, and the scripture cannot be set aside or canceled or broken or annulled. They twist this text to mean that humans like these Jewish rulers are just as much God as Jesus Christ, and therefore we must all be little gods as well. This is why, for example, John G. Lake stated, quote, we want to be gods. Jesus said, I said ye are gods, John 10, 34. It is with the attitude of gods in the world that Jesus wants the Christian to live, unquote. However, we have already explained that Psalms 82, which Jesus is quoting, isn't teaching the little God doctrine which these people espouse. The true sense of this conversation between Christ and these Jewish rulers needs to be understood. In John 10, 27-30, Jesus just got done affirming his absolute deity and unity with the Father in being in power by applying Old Testament texts to himself which were about Yahweh, and then by saying he was one with the Father. The Jews wanted to stone Jesus in verses 31-33 to for making himself God, i.e. affirming his deity. It's important to note that in verse 36, Christ defends his unique eternal sonship, i.e. his title, the Son of God. Now, in verses 34 to 36, Christ objects to their charge of blasphemy. He wants to prove that he is not blaspheming when he makes himself out to be God and calls himself the Son of God. So the way Jesus accomplishes this is to show that even undeserving mortal human judges were given titles such as Elohim and Sons of God in Psalms 82. Therefore, those ancient human judges and these Jewish rulers he's speaking to should be considered blasphemers as well by this logic. In other words, Jesus was arguing that if it is blasphemy for him to be called God or the Son of God when he is actually deity and deserving of divine titles, then surely these ancient Jewish rulers and these human judges of Psalms 82 are guilty of blasphemy since they are called Elohim and sons of God when they are neither deity nor truly deserving of divine titles. As Merrill C. Tenney notes in his commentary on John, quote, they charged him with blasphemy. Had Jesus not meant to convey a claim to deity, he undoubtedly would have protested the action of these Jews by declaring that they had misunderstood him. On the contrary, Jesus introduced an a fortiori argument from the Psalms to strengthen his statement. Psalm 82.6 represents God as addressing a group of beings whom he calls gods in the Hebrew Elohim and sons of the Most High. If then these terms can be applied to ordinary mortals or even angels, how could Jesus be accused of blasphemy? when he applied them to himself, whom the Father set apart and sent into the world on a special mission. He was asserting what he was by right, unquote. Therefore, once again, we see that the Word of Faith teacher's attempt at exalting themselves to the level of Christ has failed. 
Jesus wasn't teaching that the human judges of Psalms 82 or the Jewish rulers he was in conflict with in John 10 were actually little gods or deity. He was simply showing how depraved, shallow, and inadequate the logic behind their charge of blasphemy really was, since even undeserving mortals were called Elohim and sons of God by analogy. This is not a justification for Christians to call themselves gods or Elohim in a divine deified nature sense, as these hasty word of faith teachers assume, since one, that's not even how the word was being used in Psalms 82, it was being used in the sense of judges having granted representative power without any notion of divinization, and two, we are neither Psalm 82 judges of Israel, nor John 10 Jewish rulers. The New Testament nowhere mandates Christians calling themselves little gods. The last text to look at, which is abused by the Word of Faith movement, is 2 Peter 1.4, which states, quote, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire." Unquote. Peter said it just as plain. He said, we are partakers of the divine nature. That nature is life eternal in absolute perfection. You don't have a God in you. You are one. The heretic Kenneth Copeland further states, quote, Now Peter said by exceeding great and precious promises, you become partakers of the divine nature. All right? Are we gods? We are a class of gods, unquote. The Word of Faith movement distorts this text to mean that men become little gods or divinized like the Mormons teach. However, if one simply reads the context, it is quickly apparent that partaking in the divine nature is with respect to moral transformation and imitation of God's holy character in that respect. It has nothing to do with becoming a God-man. 2 Peter 1, 1-4 states, quote, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained a like precious faith with us in the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power hath granted unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us by his own glory and virtue, whereby he hath granted unto us his precious and exceeding great promises, that through these ye may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world by lust." Unquote. In the context, we see great emphasis on the moral transformation of the believer. It is in that sense that we can be said to be partakers of the divine nature, since we are enabled to mimic the character of God in holiness. In his commentary on 2 Peter, the New Testament scholar Jean L. Green demonstrates this point with valuable contemporaneous background information and material. Quote, Philo commented, This is the practice, I think, of kings also, who imitate the divine nature. He can even speak of the heavenly bodies sharing in the divine nature. Not that any of the occupants of heaven wander, for sharing as they do in the blessed and divine and happy nature, they are all intrinsically free from any such tendency. In his comparative analysis of Josephus, Philo, Plutarch, the Stoics, Paul, and Second Peter, Starr concludes, in all five literary groups, we also observe the same formal relationship between the divine nature and a human sharing in it, that is, between human virtue or character and God's character. Human virtue comes to resemble that of God. Peter's thought has to do with moral transformation and not divinization or becoming divine men. Peter's reflection is not principally about becoming immortal and incorruptible, but rather about the acquisition of moral character." Unquote. So the Word of Faith movement will have to look for another text. Now very briefly, some of the Word of Faith teachers have tried to say that some of the early church fathers, as well as the Eastern Orthodox Church, teach their concept of little I am's or little gods. However, as Walter Martin put it, quote, in a thorough article in Christian Research Journal, Robert Bowman made a penetrating observation some faith teachers appeal to the fact that the Church Fathers, and indeed some of the writings of the Eastern Orthodox Church itself, mention the concept of Christian deification. This, the faith teachers believe, legitimizes their claim to being little gods. 
However, as Bowman clearly points out, nothing could be further from the truth. In keeping with monotheism, says Bowman, the Eastern Orthodox do not teach that men will literally become gods, which would be polytheism. Rather, as many of the Church Fathers, they teach that men are deified in the sense that the Holy Spirit dwells within Christian believers and transforms them into the image of God in Christ, eventually endowing them in the resurrection with immortality and God's perfect moral character. The faith teachers do not speak of the believer's deification in the sense merely of the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence since, as Copeland says, you do not have a God in you, you are one. Of course, the Orthodox Church and the Fathers judged this very teaching, Gnosticism, as heresy." Unquote. The cultists teach that man is an exact duplicate of God, participating in God's divine essence or nature, or having a nature equal to that of God. However, as the scholar of Greek Orthodoxy, Christopher Levanos notes, quote, The Orthodox Church stated its position on the matter definitively in 1351, when it sanctioned the doctrine of Palamite distinction between God's energies and his essence, and the participation of humanity in the former, but not the latter." Unquote. Hence, not even the Eastern Orthodox Church would sanction the heresy of the Word of Faith movement. Biblical Protestant Christendom certainly doesn't either. These next blasphemous doctrines are so off and unthinkably satanic that one must wonder why anyone would consider the people who teach them to be Christian at all. The Word of Faith movement has both a damnable view of who Jesus is, as well as a damnable view of his precious atonement and work of redemption. According to these false teachers, when Jesus came to earth, he was not God in the flesh. He did not have both a divine and human nature, as historical biblical Christianity teaches, i.e. the hypostatic union. No, according to this sect, Jesus was only a man while on earth and did not possess a divine nature until some time later. Some of them say he only became a god at baptism and then he lost his divinity at the cross. Others say he didn't become a god or didn't become born again until after he died. As the major proponent of this heretical theology, Kenneth Copeland states, quote, He hadn't come to earth as God. He'd come as a man. And according to Copeland, Jesus prayed, quote, Not as the divine one who had authority as God, but as a man, unquote. And Jesus never believed himself to be, quote, the most high God, unquote. The heretic Hagenite Fred Price likewise uttered these blasphemous comments, quote, Jesus was on the earth just as a man, not the Son of God, unquote. Now here's what I want you to get here. If Jesus came as God, then why did God have to anoint him? Jesus came as a man, that's why it was legal to anoint him. What? We're so, and somebody said, well, Jesus came as God. I mean, you know, the Bible says God never sleeps nor slumbers. And yet in the book of Mark, we see Jesus asleep in the back of the boat. Now, please listen to me. Please listen to me. This ain't no heresy. I'm not some false prophet. I'm just reading this thing out of the Both Holy Scripture and Christian history completely refute this damnable teaching, as we will show. Now, some of the proponents do believe Jesus was the Son of God in his earthly life but that at the cross he ceased being the Son of God. He could have helped himself up until the point where he said, I commend my spirit into your hands. At that point he couldn't do nothing for himself anymore. He had become sin. He was no longer the Son of God. He was sin. This is blasphemy. This brings us to their heretical teaching of redemption. This movement teaches that Christ's death on the cross wasn't enough to pay for sins, but that Jesus actually took on Satan's nature at the cross and then went and suffered torture in hell by demons and Satan, being subjected under the quote-unquote lordship of Satan, and then he became quote-unquote born again in hell, receiving deity, then prevailing over the hosts of hell and rising from the dead. This, they say, means that Jesus was the first born-again man who became a god, 
and now we can become God's equal to Christ when we are born again. That Jesus literally suffered the flames of hell for us, that we don't have to. Earl Polk stated that, quote, Easter resurrection shows how Jesus moved from being an earthly man to being a heavenly man. Jesus stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil and overcame the principalities and powers of death, hell, and the grave, unquote. These people teach that Jesus suffered both a physical and spiritual death. Hagen explains the spiritual death by saying, quote, Spiritual death means having Satan's nature. Jesus is the first one who was ever born again, unquote. Fred Price states, quote, Do you think the punishment of our sin was to die on the cross? If that were the case, the two thieves could have paid your price. No, the punishment was to go into hell itself and to serve time in hell separated from God. Satan and all the demons of hell thought they had him bound, and they threw a net over Jesus, and they dragged him down to the very pit of hell itself to serve our sentence." Unquote. You see, these are the words that he spoke to his disciples just before he went to Calvary, just before he died, and went to hell, and took our place and suffered in the region of the damned. Jesus volunteered to go to hell. I'm going to tell you something. Ain't nobody ever got out of there. Copeland asserts that, quote, Jesus went to hell to free mankind from the penalty of Adam's high treason. When his blood poured out, it did not atone. Jesus spent three horrible days and nights in the bowels of this earth, getting back for you and me our rights with God, unquote. Hagen teaches that Jesus took on a satanic nature and became a, quote, new satanic creation. As a result, quote, Jesus became sin. His spirit was separated from God, unquote. Serpent is a symbol of Satan. Jesus Christ knew the only way he would stop Satan is by becoming one in nature with him. So what did you say? What blasphemy is this? No, you hear this. He did not take my sin. He became my sin. He became one with the nature of Satan. So all those who had the nature of Satan can partake of the nature of God. Jesus had to go through that same spiritual death in order to pay the price, now it wasn't the physical death on the cross that paid the price for sin, because if it had been, any prophet of God that had died for the last couple of thousand years before that could have paid that price. It wasn't physical death. Anybody could do that. Criflo Dollar states that Jesus, quote, suffered everything he suffered when he was here on this planet, whipped with the cat of nine tails, crucified on the cross at Calvary. Somebody says, oh, that's suffering. But he not only suffered when he was in a physical body, his spirit stepped off the cross, went to hell. The Bible says in the book of Acts, the pains of hell suffered everything that a man could ever suffer. Somebody say, what? Yep, you better hope he went through everything that you could ever go through. Because whatever Jesus did not take on, you and I would have to take on, unquote. Do you know something? The minute that blood sacrifice was accepted, Jesus was the first human being that was ever born again. Now, it was sealed. I mean, this happened when he was in hell. Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Here comes the sun. Sunday morning. God gets himself together. Ha ha. Justice has been met. Somehow the thing's been taken care of. And old God gets his voice together. And he hollers out three words. And they go roaring through the universe and entering the gates of hell. He said, it is enough. It is enough. The devil thought he had it. The devil thought he'd won. 
Oh, they were having the biggest party that ever been had. They had my Jesus in the floor, and they were standing on his back, jumping up and down and laughing, and he had become sin. Don't you think that God was pacing, wanting to put a stop to what was going on? All the hosts of hell were up on him. Up on him. Up on him. The angels are in agony. All the creation is groaning. All the host of hell was upon him. Up on him. They got on him. They got him down in the floor and got on him. And they were laughing and mocking. Ah, ha, 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 ha. You trusted God and look where you ended up. You thought he'd save you and get you off that cross. He didn't. Ha, ha, ha. Copeland states that Jesus made himself, quote, obedient to Satan and took on his nature, unquote. He states that Jesus, quote, allowed himself to come under Satan's control, unquote. He accepted the sin nature of Satan in his own spirit. You don't know what happened at the cross. Why do you think Moses, upon the instruction of God, raised a serpent upon that pole instead of a lamb? They used to bug me. I said, why in the world you got to put that snake up there, the sign of Satan? Why didn't you put a lamb on that pole? The Lord said, because it was the sign of Satan that was hanging on the cross. He said, I accepted in my own spirit, spiritual death, and the light was turned off. Why did he need to be begotten or born? Because he became like we were, separated from God. Because he tasted spiritual death for every man. And his spirit, an inner man, went to hell in my place. Can't you see that? Physical death wouldn't remove your sins. He's tasted death for every man. He's talking about tasting spiritual death. Jesus is the first person that was ever born again. Why did his spirit need to be born again? Because it was estranged from God. He became sin. He was made sin. Now he's in the pit of hell. He's down there. He's in there. Suffering like no man has ever suffered. Death and all of, all of hell's emissaries have piled in there on him to annihilate this one called the Son of God. Why did Jesus then on the cross say, my God? Because God was not his father anymore. He took upon himself the nature of Satan. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. He is not. I'm a son of he's God. He's the first fruit. You're the, you're the, he's the first fruit. He's the first born of many. With respect to this heretical theology's idea of Jesus' new birth or him being born again in hell, the cultists teach that this is when Jesus became divine or a God-man. And as noted, when people are born again, they are just as much God as Jesus, as Hagen said. This is the message, as Copeland states, quote, God turned to a man, Jesus, and called him God. He is in a higher position now than he was before he headed to the cross, unquote. Copeland goes so far as to say that he could have did what Jesus did, i.e. the work of redemption, as though Jesus' ability to redeem man were not based on his unique eternal deity and worth, Copeland teaches that he could have saved humanity on the cross in hell, since he is a born-again God-man just like Jesus is. God spoke to me, and he said, Son, realize this. Now follow me in this. Don't let your tradition trip you up. He said, think this way. A twice-born man whipped Satan in his own domain. And I threw my Bible straight up like that. I said, what? He said a born-again man defeated Satan. 
the firstborn of many brethren defeated him. He said, you are the very image and the very copy of that one. Gracious sakes alive. And it just began, I began to see what had gone on in there. And I said, well, now, you don't mean, you couldn't dare mean that I could have done the same thing. He said, oh, yeah, if you'd known that had the knowledge of the word of God that he did, you could have done the same thing. Because you reborn man, too. This is damnable heresy. These bizarre set of beliefs are 100% unique to this modern word of faith group or sect and they have nothing to do with historical biblical Christianity. According to Holy Scripture, Jesus was God while on earth. That is, Jesus pre-existed as deity and became incarnate or took on flesh in the first century. When incarnated, he possessed both a divine and human nature. He did not set aside his deity while on earth as these people claim. He simply set aside his glory and exaltation. That Jesus remained deity while on earth and came as God in the flesh is evidenced in hundreds of texts. For example, in Isaiah 40, 3, 5, and 9 to 11, it is predicted that Yahweh would come to his people after a voice in the wilderness announced his coming. Quote, a voice cries in the wilderness preparing the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good news, lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules from him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, he will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. This was fulfilled in the New Testament when John the Baptist, the voice crying in the wilderness, prepared the way for God Almighty, quote, During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, and he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord and makes his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God." Unquote. John the Baptist, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, makes the way for Yahweh so that Yahweh God could appear to his people as the scriptures prophesied. However, John the Baptist declares that he is actually making the way for Jesus Christ. Quote, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John 1, 23 and 29 to 31 state, quote, He, John the Baptist, said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel." Unquote. When Jesus appeared, the scripture about Yahweh appearing to his people was fulfilled, since Jesus Christ is God incarnate. As John 1, 1 and 14 states, quote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth." Unquote. Hence, when Word of Faith teachers claim that Jesus came merely as a man and not God, i.e. that he had no divine nature while on earth, they are clearly teaching heresy contrary to the biblical message. Moreover, in the Old Testament book Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, it is predicted that Yahweh will come to his people in relation to the new covenant, quote, 
Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts." Unquote. This again refers to John the Baptist paving the path for Christ, as Christ himself teaches in Matthew 11.10, when he applies this text to himself and John the Baptist, saying, quote, This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you, unquote. As R.T. France notes, quote, John is not just a prophet, but the messenger of Malachi 3.1. In Malachi, the wording is before me, and his role is to prepare the coming of God for judgment. Jesus' application of this text to John implies that his own, Jesus' coming, for which John prepares, is the coming of God himself, an application which is the more staggering for being so calmly assumed." Unquote. Thus, it's quite clear that while on earth Jesus was not merely a man, as the cultists teach, he was uniquely God in the flesh. Further proof that Christ was God while on earth can be found in many other texts, such as Colossians 1, 19-20, which states, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross." Unquote. Likewise, Colossians 2.9 states that, quote, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Unquote. Commenting on this text, Robert Bowman and J. Ed Komisowski note, quote, The word translated deity, theotes, means the nature or state of being God. The King James Version translates the word as Godhead, which was accurate in the English of Shakespeare's day, but is somewhat misleading today. Many people use the term the Godhead to refer to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit considered collectively. The suffix head in English, however, usually meant status, state, or nature, and in modern English has been largely displaced by hood. Thus, the equivalent word for Godhead today would be Godhood. This word is about as exact a translation of theotes as one could want. What Paul says about Christ is that all the fullness of what constitutes God dwells bodily in Christ." Unquote. That Christ possessed both a divine and human nature at once can be deduced from many other texts, such as Hebrews 4.15 which states, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. In 1 Corinthians 2.8, where it is stated that they, quote, crucified the Lord of glory, unquote. Both Christ's human and divine natures are strongly indicated in such texts. The heresy of the word of faith, which teaches that while on earth Christ was only a man, is rejected and negated by the Christians in the early church as well. Writing around the second century, the early church writer Tertullian stated, quote, We see plainly the twofold state, which is not confounded but conjoined in one person, Jesus, God and man. Concerning Christ, indeed I defer what I have to say. I remark here, the property of each nature is so wholly preserved." Unquote. Similarly, writing in the second century, Melito of Sardis stated that Christ, quote, is by nature both God and man. Unquote. In his letter to the Ephesian Christians, Ignatius, a student of the original apostles, wrote, quote, There is one physician who is possessed both of flesh and spirit, both made and not made, God existing in flesh. Unquote. Many more early Christian writers could be quoted affirming Christ's deity while on earth and his two natures since the doctrine of the hypostatic union is the historical biblical belief of the Christian church. The word of faith heresy of Christ simply being a man while on earth is rejected by all of established biblical and ancient Christendom. Finally, if Christ were simply a man on earth with no divine nature, no one would be redeemed. As Rod Rosenblatt notes, quote, the reformers knew, unlike Copeland, Hagen, and the others, that unless Jesus was true God and true man, indeed history's only God-man, united and preserved in one single consciousness, we were still in our sins. If Jesus Christ were not God in human flesh, he could not have functioned as our Redeemer, and we are all lost. Very simply, 
Only a man could stand in the place of sinful persons and bear their punishment. But if Jesus were only a man, his sacrifice would be insufficient. Our redemption rests particularly on his deity." Unquote. Hence this movement is in serious damnable error. While on earth, Jesus said, quote, Unless you believe I am, which is a divine title of God from the Old Testament, you will die in your sins, John 8, 24. Since the Word of Faith movement denies that Jesus was divine while on earth, they fall under that condemnation. This brings us to the cultists' false view of Jesus taking on a satanic nature, their view of redemption and atonement. The belief that Jesus' death on the cross was insufficient and that Jesus needed to suffer in hell for our sins with a sin nature is one of the worst heresies I have ever encountered. Firstly, that Christ's sacrificial death was sufficient for the purpose of taking care of human sin is clear from many texts. 1 Peter 2.24 states that, quote, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, unquote. Notice, it does not say he bore our sins on the cross and in hell. Secondly, Colossians 2.13-14 states that God has, quote, forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross." Unquote. Notice, the record of sin debt we owed was not canceled because of Jesus' alleged time in hell. It was nailed to the cross because the cross was sufficient to take care of sin. Thirdly, at the culmination of his sacrificial crucifixion in John 19.30, Jesus stated, quote, it is finished." Unquote. In the Greek, tetelestai, which literally means debt paid in full. It was finished. The sin debt God's people owed was paid in full by Christ on the cross. Thus, there was no need for Christ to suffer in hell under the quote-unquote lordship of Satan, God forbid. Ephesians 1.7 states, quote, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Unquote. Notice, redemption through Christ's blood on the cross, not some spiritual torment in hell, that's blasphemy. In Ephesians 2.16, we are taught that Jesus' death on the cross reconciles both Jew and Gentile to God, quote, and to reconcile them both in one body to God, through the cross, by which the hostility has been killed, unquote. The cross is what takes care of sin, not some alleged spiritual death or torment in hell. Romans 3.25 states, quote, Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith, unquote. The Greek word for propitiation here, halostration, is a reference to the Old Testament mercy seat, which was a cover over the Ark of the Covenant where Yahweh appeared over and where sacrificial blood was poured at the Day of Atonement ritual once a year. See Leviticus 16. This is how Hebrews 9.5 also uses the word, and how many of the LXX occurrences are used. Thus, what is deduced with respect to Christ's sacrifice is that, as Douglas J. Moo notes, quote, In the Old Testament and Jewish tradition, this mercy seat came to be applied generally to the place of atonement. By referring to Christ as this mercy seat, then, Paul would be inviting us to view Christ as the new covenant equivalent or antitype to this old covenant place of atonement and, derivatively, to the ritual of atonement itself. What in the Old Testament was hidden from public view behind the veil has now been publicly displayed as the Old Testament ritual is fulfilled and brought to an end in Christ's once-for-all sacrifice. This interpretation, which has an ancient and respectable heritage, has been gaining strength in recent years." Unquote. With respect to this view's ancient heritage, Mu cites Origen, Theodoret, Luther, Calvin, and Bangle as some prominent figures. Thus, since this Old Testament atonement shadow is perfectly fulfilled or accomplished by Christ's blood, as Romans 3.25 explicitly states, there is no room to assert that Jesus would have to suffer in hell for sins. His blood on the cross was sufficient for Copeland to assert that, quote, when his blood poured out, it did not atone, unquote. 
he is clearly contradicting Holy Scripture with his doctrine of demons. Jesus did not have to die spiritually in hell for sins, and Scripture nowhere teaches that. In fact, Scripture teaches the opposite. This movement is bold in their assertion that Jesus suffered twice, once physically and once spiritually, once on the cross and once in hell. However, 1 Peter 3.18 is clear when it states that Christ, quote, suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, unquote. He suffered once for sins, not twice. Hebrews 9.28 likewise states, quote, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, unquote. And Hebrews 10.10, quote, And by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, unquote. Moving on. With respect to this idea that Jesus becoming sin means Jesus was united with Satan, i.e. taking on a satanic nature, this is also erroneous and heretical. Since Jesus is one of the three persons in the Godhead sharing in the one being of God, this means that if Jesus took on a satanic nature or was united with the devil, then God took on a satanic nature and was united with the devil. That thought alone should dispel this bizarre theology. In 1 John 1.5, we read that, quote, God is light, and in him is no darkness at all, unquote. Since God is light and has no darkness, this means he would not be united with Satan, which is the very epitome of darkness. Habakkuk 1.13 states that, quote, You who are of pure eyes than to see evil, and cannot look at wrong, unquote. God cannot look at wrong, let alone be united in nature with something which is the very definition of wrongness. To say that Jesus received a satanic nature is to say that Jesus had sin in him or was sinful by nature. However, Hebrews 4.15 teaches that Jesus was, quote, without sin, and 1 Peter 2.22 states that, quote, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth, unquote. Despite textual information like this, the Word of Faith people will distort 2 Corinthians 5.21 to mean that Jesus took on a satanic nature and was united with the devil. It states, quote, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, unquote. They claim that Jesus being made sin here supports their doctrine. However, the Greek phrase used, hamartion epoiesan, literally means made sin, and hamartion, or sin here, means sacrifice for sin. As David J. A. Kleins observes, quote, The Hebrew word for sin, hatat, and consequently the LXX hamartia, sin, Paul's word here, are occasionally used for sin offering, for example Leviticus 4.24, and it is probable that this is Paul's meaning here. Christ's death is frequently spoken of as a sin offering, for example, Romans 8.3, Hebrews 7.29, 9.12, John 1.29, Isaiah 53.6 and 10. Paul is careful to avoid any suggestion that Christ became sinful or a sinner and explicitly asserts that he had no sin." Unquote. Vine's complete expository dictionary of Old and New Testament words agrees that this Greek word hamartion takes on this meaning. It states that hamartion can be seen, quote, as an offering for sin, i.e. a sin offering. So the Septuagint, for example, in Leviticus 4.32, chapter 5, verse 6, 7, 8, and 9, unquote. And with respect to 2 Corinthians 5.21 specifically, the same source goes on to say, quote, Him he made to be sin indicates that God dealt with him as he must deal with sin, and that Christ fulfilled what was typified in the guilt offering." Unquote. This is the same concept found in Isaiah 53.10 where Jesus is made an Assam in the Hebrew, a guilt offering or sin offering. That's what 2 Corinthians 5.21 is saying when it says that Christ was hamartion epoesin, or made a sin offering on our behalf. It's not saying that Christ was united to Satan or took on a satanic nature in the sense of transmutation. This is why grammar and context is so important. Our sins were imputed to Christ in a legal nature. He paid for sins on the cross and was therefore a sacrifice for sin or sin offering. We respond by faith and receive salvation. 
there is nothing whatsoever about Jesus being united with the devil or having a satanic nature. That has to be read backwards into the text because it simply is not there. Now, the other main argument the cultists use to support their heresy, that Jesus was united to the devil and received a satanic nature, has to do with John 3, 14 and 15, where Jesus' crucifixion is compared with Moses lifting up a bronze serpent on a wooden pole in the wilderness, so that the Israelites who looked at it would not be killed by desert snakes. This can be found in the Old Testament book of Numbers 21, 4 to 9. This comparison, along with the idea that a serpent represents the sign of Satan, the Word of Faith teachers say, proves that Jesus had a satanic nature on the cross and was united to Satan. This is the esoteric argument. However, no biblical writer ever makes such a connection. That is to say, no one in the Bible states that the reason this comparison between Jesus' crucifixion and the bronze serpent on the pole was made was because Jesus took on a satanic nature. No one in church history ever believed that comparison was made because of that either. This is as absurd as me arguing that since 1 Peter 1.19 calls Jesus a spotless lamb, a motif found in the Old Testament, that therefore this means Jesus at the cross was united to all lambs by nature. Since no biblical writer makes that connection, I am not justified in claiming that's what the comparison means. And because of this fact, the Word of Faith teachers like Copeland are forced to say that God told them audibly that this is what the comparison means. Well, of course Copeland would say that because the Bible certainly doesn't tell him that explicitly. Secondly, very clearly the comparison was made not because of any ontological similarity between Jesus and a serpent, but simply because when one looks to Christ by repentant faith they receive life, just as the Israelites looked at the serpent on the pole to be spared in Numbers. And the serpent on the pole signified the sin of Israel, just as Jesus' crucifixion symbolized the sin of the world. That is as far as the Bible allows the typology to go. Hence, the Word of Faith view is eisegetical and not actually found in the text. It should therefore be rejected. Now, with respect to this movement's view that Jesus suffered in hell for three days, being tortured by demons and Satan, and then needing to be born again, this is pure blasphemy. Nothing in scripture even begins to hint at such a teaching. Jesus' spirit did not get tortured in hell after the cross. On the cross, at the end of the crucifixion, Jesus yielded up his spirit to God. Luke 23, 46 states, quote, then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last breath." Unquote. It does not say, into hell I commit my spirit for torture. Secondly, as opposed to saying that he would be tortured in hell, Jesus stated the following to the repentant thief on the cross in Luke 23, 43, quote, And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today, you will be with me in paradise." Unquote. This clearly demonstrates that Jesus did not anticipate suffering in hell for three days after his crucifixion. However, despite this clear reading of scripture, Joyce Meyer has attempted to distort this verse to mean something other than what it says. And in Luke 23, 43, Jesus said unto him, I say unto you today, you shall be in paradise with me. There's no punctuation in the original translations of the Bible. We have punctuated it. And in this particular scripture, it was punctuated wrong. They put in there, I say unto you, comma, today you shall be in paradise with me. Making it appear that the minute Jesus died on the cross, he went straight to paradise. No, 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 he did not. The way it should read is, I say unto you today, come. I'm telling you this today. Today I'm telling you that you are going to be in paradise with me. But he didn't say you're going to be there today. He said, I'm telling you this today. However, merely asserting that the text should be translated that way is not an argument. The reason why what Meyer is saying is false is because Jesus always says something like, truly I say to you or truly I tell you, and never, truly I say to you today, or truly I say to you right now. If Jesus is doing that here in Luke 23, 43, 
it would be the only example of such an occurrence in the dozens of repeated examples where he makes these kind of expressions prefacing his teaching. Therefore, the biblical evidence is squarely against her interpretation. But it is not surprising that cultists would twist the word of God when it conflicts with their doctrine. The Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses do the same thing. The word of faith teaching is that Jesus triumphed over Satan and the demons only after being tortured and tormented by them in hell. However, according to Holy Scripture, Jesus triumphed over them at the cross. With respect to the crucifixion, Paul states in Colossians 2, 14-15, quote, He has destroyed what was against us, a certificate of indebtedness expressed in decrees opposed to us. He has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. Disarming the rulers and authorities, he has made a public disgrace of them, triumphing over them by the cross." Unquote. Satan and his powers were disgraced and triumphed at the cross. There was no need for them to be conquered again after some non-existent spiritual death of Christ in hell followed by a rebirth. Hebrews 2.14 echoes the same thing, quote, Through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. Unquote. Clearly the word of faith is teaching that Jesus had to do something in hell which was already accomplished at the cross. Now, the word of faith distorts Colossians 1.18, which says Jesus was, quote, the firstborn from the dead, to mean that Jesus was the first born again man. They say this proves Jesus was born again in hell and became a god. Remember their teaching is that Jesus isn't unique. Jesus, as well as all humans, receive God's nature, substance, and being in their spirits, and that to this movement means being born again, or a new birth, becoming a god. As Hagen states, quote, there is a real incarnation at the new birth, unquote, and, quote, God imparts his very nature, substance, and being into our human spirits, unquote. They say this happened to Christ in hell, as Copeland asserts, quote, it is important for us to realize that a born-again man defeated Satan. Colossians 1.18 refers to Jesus as the firstborn from the dead. He was the first man to be reborn." Unquote. However, Colossians 1.18 is not talking about being born again. It's simply a way to say that Jesus was the first to rise from the dead by his power to a state of immortality which the rest of creation can expect at the final resurrection preceding the Day of Judgment. 1 Corinthians 15.20 says the same thing in a different way, quote, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept, unquote. This has to do with Christ's foundational resurrection to immortality. That is the sense in which Christ is the firstborn from the dead, or firstfruits. It has nothing whatsoever to do with Jesus becoming born again in hell. Walter C. Kaiser, Peter H. Davids, Manfred T. Brock, and F. F. Bruce note that firstborn is, quote, used of Christ as the firstborn from the dead, for he is the first to rise to unending life, although others before him were raised from the dead to temporal life, and also the chief or leader of all those who will rise from the dead, unquote. Hence, it is widely known by Christians that this has nothing to do with Jesus being born again in hell. There is not one text which states that Jesus was ever born again or needed to be. This is pure fantasy. Now, the final text to examine is Acts 2.31, which in the King James states, quote, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption, unquote. Now, a few points need to be made about this text. First, this is a quote from Psalms 1610, where David speaks of Christ. In the original Hebrew, it says that, quote, You will not abandon my soul to Sheol, unquote. In Acts 2.31, the Greek is Hades, which is the New Testament equivalent of Sheol. Sheol and Hades are the temporary abode of the dead, where they wait until resurrection and judgment. Thus, the KJV should not have translated this place as hell, but left it as Hades, as other translations do. Hell is actually Gehenna, or the lake of fire, which comes about after the final judgment. Hence, no one is in hell right now, and therefore, Jesus couldn't have been. As Robert Morey notes in his work, Death in the Afterlife, the standard work on this subject, which is, quote, 
the most comprehensive biblical study of this subject in the last half century, according to Dr. Walter Martin, quote, While Sheol and Hades describe the temporary abode of the dead until resurrection, Gehenna is the place of future punishment in the eternal state, unquote. It would therefore be impossible for Jesus to suffer in hell or Gehenna, since that place doesn't even exist yet, and will not until after the Day of Judgment. This requires a bit of further explaining. In the Old Testament times, the dead went to Sheol, which had two sections. One section for the good people known as Abraham's bosom, and one section for the bad people. After Jesus' resurrection, there was a shift. The damned go to Sheol or Hades, and the saved go to heaven to await final resurrection, since the good part of Sheol was emptied to heaven after Jesus' ascension. See Philippians 1.23 and 2 Corinthians 5.6-8. After the day of judgment, Sheol or Hades, which is now comprised of damned people, gets emptied into the lake of fire, i.e. hell or Gehenna. This is all exegetically and historically proven in Maury's fine work. Therefore, the Word of Faith movement is guilty of confusing Hell, Gehenna, and the Lake of Fire with the pre-judgment day state known as Sheol or Hades, which is where Jesus went and proclaimed victory after his crucifixion. So Jesus never went to Hell and suffered there. Secondly, although Jesus went to Sheol or Hades and not Hell, he didn't do so to be tortured. He did so, as many scholars argue, for the purpose of proclaiming his redemptive victory to the spirits who are in prison there waiting for judgment. See 1 Peter 3, 18-20 and 22, and 2 Peter 2, 4-5. This is what Acts 2.31 refers to when it speaks about God not abandoning Christ's soul to Sheol or Hades. Christ proclaimed a victory there, went to heaven, and then was raised from the dead bodily. He was not tortured, abandoned, or left in Hades. Nothing about suffering in hell for sins at all. Christ's suffering was accomplished at the cross. Now, some Word of Faith proponents argue something like, doesn't the Apostles' Creed from the early church period say Jesus was, quote, crucified, died, and was buried? He descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead, unquote? Well, the earliest forms of the Creed did not include that reference to hell, but even in this later form, the Latin word used is inferna, which was the lower world I mentioned, where persons wait for final judgment. The creed isn't referring to hell in the sense of a fiery pit where the damned go for eternity, but the waiting place where Jesus went and proclaimed victory. As J.I. Packer notes, quote, Originally, hell meant the place of the departed as such, corresponding to the Greek Hades and the Hebrew Sheol. That is what it means here, where the creed echoes Peter's statement that thou wilt not abandon my soul to Hades in Psalm 1610. But since the 17th century, hell has been used to dignify only the state of final retribution for the godless, for which the New Testament name is Gehenna. What the creed means, however, is that Jesus entered not Gehenna, but Hades that is, that he really died, and that it was from a genuine death, not a simulated one, that he rose." Unquote. Hence, the Apostles' Creed does not support the idea that Jesus went to what the Word of Faith movement means by hell. The Creed doesn't teach that Jesus was tormented or put under the quote-unquote lordship of Satan either. That's read in. There is no evidence that Satan or demons are sovereign in Hades or in a position to make anyone subject under their quote-unquote lordship. This is more mythological than anything. The spirits in Hades awaiting judgment, for example, are locked up in chains, see 2 Peter 2.4. Plus, 1 Peter 5.8 states that Satan roams the earth seeking people to devour. There is simply no biblical evidence for the idea that Jesus was tortured in hell, put under Satan's lordship in hell, or born again in hell. None. Now, because the Word of Faith movement has so confused and twisted the meaning and nature of Christ's redemptive work, they have, as a result, lost sight of the Gospel. They have a false Gospel. This is shown, for example, in the way the influential Word of Faith teacher Earl Polk presents salvation. Polk taught that Jesus only conquered death, hell, and the grave for himself, and, as an example, so that we can save ourselves. Quote, how are we doing to conquer death? We are overcomers through Jesus Christ because we are learning the tools he used. We are learning to move in authority and power. We implement the concepts of his heart and mind. 
Jesus the First Fruit teaches us the secrets of overcoming the last enemy, unquote. He also states, quote, understand that we must do everything that Jesus Christ did, unquote. So in this system, Jesus is the Savior because he teaches us by example how we save ourselves using his tools. Sadly, this means that these people know nothing of the gospel and salvation. Jesus didn't show us how to save ourselves. Jesus Christ suffered the penalty for our sin, purchasing our salvation which is received by repentant faith in the person and work of Christ. Those who view Jesus as merely an example of how one is to save themselves will be damned. Those who do not trust that Jesus' work on the cross was sufficient to pay for sin and instead try to work their way to salvation using quote-unquote tools will be damned. That's salvation by works. This kind of distortion and misunderstanding of the gospel and salvation is common with others in the movement as well. For example, instead of teaching that justification is a once-for-all legal declaration from God, that a person is righteous based on the work of Christ received by faith, Word of Faith teacher Jimmy Swaggart stated that it's a lie to believe, quote, the believer's sins are already forgiven, past, present, and future, and that, quote, his sins are not taken into account, unquote. Instead, he, like the Roman Catholics, teaches, quote, these same acts of grace are available, and again, instantly, the Lord cleanses him and justifies him, unquote. However, that's not biblical justification. Romans 5.1 teaches that justification is a one-time past thing, quote, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, unquote. Justification is not a process where you can lose it and gain it through works. Justification is by faith alone. Works do necessarily follow from the person's changed heart as evidence of salvation, but works don't contribute to justification. As Galatians 5.4 states, quote, You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace, unquote. In stark contrast to this biblical teaching on justification by faith alone through Christ's finished work alone, Earl Polk and Kenneth Copeland uttered the following satanic blasphemies, quote, We must learn how to enter into his vicariousness. Jesus is our example, as one who lived in perfect harmony with God's direction for his life. Now the body of Christ must complete the work which Christ began, unquote. Quote, when Jesus cried, it is finished, he was not speaking of the plan of redemption. Jesus' death on the cross was only the beginning of the complete work of redemption, unquote. To teach that men must add their own righteousness to supplement Christ's completed work of redemption in regards to men being made right with God, and to say that Christ's work on the cross was insufficient, is a satanic attack on Christ's mission on this earth. Now, many people may be shocked to have learned about all of these satanic heresies from these people. They may wonder how such apparently nice and loving ministers of God could actually be promoting such satanic teachings. However, 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15 warns the Christian church of these very kinds of people, quote, and no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds, unquote. Also, Acts 20.30 warns, quote, And from among your own selves will arise men, speaking twisted things, to draw away the disciples after them, unquote. attack the devils of hell. Thou foul spirits come against this child of God. I break your power. Go! 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 Jesus name. Loose them. Arms and legs are going to grow out the right length and begin to move around and work. Hallelujah. And supernatural money is going to start coming into people's lives. Jesus name I'm gonna beat the devil off of you today to a darkened world today but he's waiting for you and me to say
Oh, that spoken word is the key. Speak that thing. Decree that thing, and it shall come to pass. Whatever it is in your life that you're decreeing right in the first installment, Joel Osteen, Origins and Errors of his teaching, we partially examined Osteen's positive confession doctrine, which says one can speak and think things like wealth into existence. That's why on a regular basis we should say, I'm blessed, I'm healthy, I'm strong, I'm valuable, I'm talented, I have a bright future. Those words go out of your mouth and come right back into your own ears. Over time, they will create the same image on the inside. All of the people in this Word of Faith movement believe the same unbiblical, greed-based, thought power theology as well. You call what you have, you say what you want. What you believe in your heart, you'll have whatever you say. You've got to say it, you've got to speak it, you've got to s decree it. You decree the thing, you pay your vow, and then. He brings it to pass. It's in the word. It Words are containers for power. They carry creative or destructive power, positive or negative power. And so we need to be speaking right things over our lives and about our futures if we expect to have good things happen. Because what you say today is what you'll probably end up having tomorrow. Look at me, say, 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 all, all of you. Say, there's power in me, power in me. to speak life and death. Their belief is that faith is a force like gravity, and when you believe or speak something you desire, you will receive it, money, cars, health, etc. Kenneth Hagin stated, quote, You can have what you say, you can write your own ticket with God, and the first step in writing your own ticket with God is, say it, unquote. Hagin's four-point motto, which he purports to have received from Christ himself through prophetic revelation is, quote, say it, do it, receive it, and tell it, unquote. Dr. John MacArthur points out that, quote, Hagen claims Jesus told him, if anybody anywhere will take these four steps and put these four principles into operation, he will always have whatever he wants from me or God the Father, unquote. This system arose out of the fact that these people think they are gods, and like God, they can speak things into existence, like how God did in the Genesis creation account where God said, let there be light, and there was light. On this same line, Charles Capps wrote, quote, the creative ability of man comes through his spirit. He speaks spirit words that work in the world of the spirit. They will also dominate the physical world. He breathes spirit life into God's word, and it becomes a living substance working for him as it worked for God in the beginning." Unquote. Now, you have a choice to believe it or to doubt it. If you have a problem, any kind of housing, transportation, situation in a marriage, you can release the creative, see this all works by faith, the creative force of God into existence. Gloria Copeland goes so far as to say that Christians should try to control the weather like a little god. So you're the weatherman. You get out there, or the weather woman, whichever it is, and you talk to that thing, and you tell it you're not coming here, I command you to dissipate. Now, due to this teaching, greed has become a major factor in these people's doctrine. This movement has become well known for its heavy emphasis on seeking finance and material possessions as a goal. And I said, I claim $150 this week. I'm just going to be there one week. <laughs> Satan, take your hand off my money. <laughs> Go ministering spirits and cause the money to come. Robert Tilton states, quote, My God's rich, and he's trying to show you how to draw out your heavenly account that Jesus bought and paid for and purchased for you at Calvary, unquote. He states, quote, New house, new car, that's chicken feed. That's nothing compared to what God wants to do for you, unquote. Because Brother Hagen was such a, a man that I highly esteem. I thank God for Brother Hagen. All right, but now I see it. I got to believe I receive it. Then I will have it. I must believe that I receive it, not feel that you have it. Kenneth Copeland stated, quote, You must realize that it is God's will for you to prosper. This is available to you, and frankly, it would be stupid of you not to partake of it, unquote. Joel Osteen teaches that when you demand riches through your declaration, 
All of heaven comes to fulfill your material desires, like money and cars, which sound similar to a butler or maid. Quote, Everything I put my hands to prospers and succeeds. Friend, when you make those kinds of bold declarations, all heaven comes to attention to back up God's word. Hagen talk, quote, Believe in your heart, say it with your mouth. That is the principle of faith. You can have what you say. In answering this doctrine, two things need to be explored. We must examine whether or not Holy Scripture teaches that Christians should go around attempting to decree or command things into existence with thoughts and words like God does, and we also need to examine whether or not it's biblical to focus on seeking material wealth and if Holy Scripture promises financial prosperity as this movement teaches. Since Holy Scripture is the ultimate authority for Christians, it is where we must look for these answers. We will first offer a refutation of both ideas and then provide a response to the few passages this movement distorts to try to support their teaching. The idea that humans are little gods and can thus speak or declare things into existence conflicts with God's statements in Job chapter 38. In this text, God questions Job and in doing so shows just how wiser, more glorious, and more powerful he is compared to Job and all humanity. For example, in verse 4, God posits things such as, quote, Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you possess understanding, unquote. In verse 12, God asks, quote, Have you ever in your life commanded the morning or made the dawn know its place, unquote? Now, this would be an odd question if word of faith theology is true. If their teaching were true, then Job could have easily responded to God and said something like, Although you command the morning, we believers command great things into existence all the time since we're little gods too. If name it and claim it heresy is real, then the force of God's question to Job would be severely diminished, but it's not. Also in verse 34, God says, quote, Can you raise your voice to the clouds so that a flood of water covers you? Again, if word of faith proponents like Gloria Copeland are correct in their teaching, that believers can and should declare the weather to change, God's argument or question to Job here makes little sense. Why if God affirmed that believers can command the weather to change, would he even highlight his ability to command weather and nature as an argument for his superiority over Job and humans? Lastly, going into chapter 39, God states the following in verse 27, quote, Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? Unquote. If believers have the ability to command and decree things into existence or control their environment in this way, as this movement teaches, what point is there in God saying that he commands the eagles to mount up and make nests on high? Very clearly, these texts show that commanding or decreeing things into existence is God's unique prerogative, and it is one of the many things which set him above humanity. Therefore, to attribute to humans the same ability is to once again attempt to exalt man and demote God, Satan and the Antichrist's favorite thing to do. But you are the one that has authority over the weather. What is more, Psalms 33, 8 and 9 state, quote, Let all of the earth fear the Lord. Let all of the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm, unquote. What is deduced from this text is that God's ability to command or speak things to be warrants our fear and praising awe. If the Word of Faith movement's teaching is true, then logically believers are worthy of fear and praising awe as well, since they can speak and command things into existence with their godlike decretive abilities. That is the logical conclusion despite the fact that the Word of Faith proponents would probably refuse such worship and reverence. Clearly, only God can speak and command things into existence, since if believers could, they would be worthy of the worship and awe which he alone deserves. There is no text anywhere in Holy Scripture which describes man as a creator investing him with the ability to speak or think things into existence. As D.R. McConnell argues, quote, The concept of creative faith denigrates the entire trinity, the Father's exclusive role as the source of creation the Son's exclusive role as the agent of creation, and the Spirit's exclusive role as the executor of creation. The creation is from the Father, through the Son, and by the Holy Spirit. 
Man is a creature, and no creature in the Bible is ever accorded creative power. No man, no angel, no devil, no animal. The closest that the Bible comes to investing man with creative powers is God's command to be fruitful and multiply." Unquote. Now, these people claim that it is foolish to pray, quote, if it be thy will, unquote, to God, whereby one shows their utter dependence on God. We don't have to pray for your will, Lord. Who is it? Whenever I pray it, I should always say the will of the Lord be done. Now, doesn't that sound humble? It does. Sounds like humility. It's really stupidity. Although these people feel fit to go around acting like they're decreeing what they desire, commanding things into existence as such, and saying that if you pray God's will be done, that means you don't have enough faith, Holy Scripture and Biblical history show that one should have a more humble, respectful, and God-honoring approach to things, whereby one is completely dependent on God's mercy or compassion, whether pain or pleasure comes. For example, in Daniel 3, 17-18, Daniel's godly friends are about to be incinerated by Nebuchadnezzar for not worshipping his false gods. Now, instead of decreeing their own safety or speaking their safety into existence, this is the example given to us, quote, If our God, whom we are serving, exists, he is able to rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will rescue us, O king, from your power as well. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we don't serve your gods, and we will not pay homage to the golden statue that you have erected." Unquote. Notice they realized the outcome depended on God's will, and they were going to hold fast to their conviction and beliefs, even if God's will was not to save their lives from this threat. They didn't have the arrogant attitude of Word of Faith teachers, which says one ought to just decree things themselves, since it is quote-unquote foolish, to depend on God's will or choice. Moreover, in 2 Samuel 10:12, Joab doesn't attempt to decree a war victory or speak victory into existence. Instead, we see total reliance on God's will, and Joab is satisfied with whatever outcome God chooses, since God is the sovereign king who deserves praise and honor no matter what. Quote, Be strong, let's fight bravely for the sake of our people and the cities of our God. The Lord will do what he decides is best." Unquote. This needs to be the Christian example, not the idea that we should set aside the supremacy of God's will and try to create our own reality with human speech, thought, and decree. In opposition to the Word of Faith movement, Jesus in the Gethsemane prayer stated, quote, Yet not what I will, but what you will. Unquote. Notice there is no arrogance on the part of Christ as there is in the Word of Faith movement. Clearly, humbly praying if it be God's will is the biblical example. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul shows that it is erroneous to try to attempt to decree or speak things into existence, and instead shows that Christians are to humbly pray and rely on God's will and compassion, even if God does not feel it is the right time for our prayer to be answered, or if it won't be answered. Paul states, quote, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you, always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you." Unquote. Notice Paul's desires and prayers are subject to the will of God, the approval and timing of God. Paul knew that, so he made sure to highlight the point that his aspirations will only come to pass if God so wills it and enables that to take place. He doesn't arrogantly decree his aspirations or speak them into being as if he were some little God. He relied totally on God. Well, he will all right if it's his will, but it might not be his will, people have said. And yet, you don't find that kind of talk in the New Testament. I'm going to pray the prayer of faith, not one of those, Lord, if it be thy will. Christians in the early church period opposed this word of faith idea that one ought to not pray for God's will to be done. For example, John Cassian, AD 360-435 stated, quote, Thy will be done, that is, thine, not ours. For if we recall the text of the apostle that we do not know what to pray for as we ought, we realize that we sometimes ask for things which are contrary to our salvation, 
and that what we ask for is quite properly denied us by him who sees our well-being more clearly and truly than we do." Unquote. Speaking to this particular word of faith error, Dr. John MacArthur notes, quote, Hagen has also written, It is unscriptural to pray, if it is the will of God. When you put an if on your prayer, you are praying in doubt. Romans 8.27 tells us that even the Holy Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And what will the word faith movement do with James 4.13-16? Does not their most fundamental teaching utterly contradict this passage? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we shall go to such and such a city, and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil." Unquote. When Jesus taught the disciples how to pray in Matthew 6, Jesus made sure to include the following in his model prayer, quote, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Unquote. However, the Word of Faith movement doesn't believe in praying for God's will to be done, since that allegedly shows that one has doubt wrong. That doesn't show doubt, it shows that a person affirms God is on the throne and man isn't. Now, although this movement doesn't accept it, Holy Scripture teaches that God is in complete sovereign control over all things, and it is always His sovereign decree of will which is accomplished, even when a person's will or desire contradicts it. Thus, if a Christian tries to pray for something, and it is not in God's eternal decree of will for that thing to come to pass, then it won't. Ephesians 1.11 states that God, quote, works all things according to the counsel of His will. In Isaiah 43.13, God says, quote, when I act, who can reverse it, unquote. Job 23.13 states, quote, He is unchangeable, and who can turn Him back? What He desires, that He does, unquote. Proverbs 19.21 states, quote, many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails." Unquote. Daniel 4.35 states, quote, All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, What have you done? Unquote. God's will, his eternal purpose or plan, is what has supremacy. If the Word of Faith movement had a proper view of the sovereignty of God and his decrees, then they wouldn't be so quick to denounce the idea that a Christian should pray for something only if it be God's will, since that's the only way a prayer would be answered. God should be prayed to as the sovereign king and sustainer, the glorious enthroned master of the universe, worthy of all glory and honor, the one from whom all good comes. Christians have no biblical basis to go around trying to decree things as if they are little gods attempting to set aside the ultimacy of God's will. Holy Scripture is clear that sometimes God will not grant our requests, but will show us that we must submit to God's will instead. For example, in 2 Corinthians 12, 7-9, Paul says that, Although he prayed that his thorn in his flesh be taken out, it was not God's will. God denied Paul's request. Now, many of these people go so far as to denounce prayer altogether and say that one should stick with decreeing things into existence themselves. Went on back over the house, laid down, took me now. That, that settles it. I don't, she said don't pray, so I don't pray. You spoke it. I, I've never, I've never, for me personally, I've never prayed about finances and again. That day to the 19th. Oh, Paul, he Do you claim the amount you need, though? Yeah, I yeah. claim it, but I don't pray like we used to. You command the dead to rise, you command money to come to you, that's the way you take authority over the material world around you. You do not pray. How these people can claim to be Christians who follow Holy Scripture is amazing due to the fact that there are literally hundreds of texts where the Old Testament saints pray, Jesus prays, Jesus exhorts Christians how to pray, the apostles pray, and the early church prays. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, quote, Pray without ceasing, unquote. It doesn't say decree or speak things into existence without ceasing. Philippians 4, 6 says, quote, In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, unquote. It does not say, do not pray and let your requests be known to God, instead decree things yourself. 
Some of you today are praying about things you should be speaking to. You don't need to pray about that fear anymore. You need to say, fear, I command you to leave. With regard to this movement's consistent emphasis on material wealth and possessions, such a focus is unbiblical. I mean, what does whatsoever mean? Whatsoever means house, car, Rolls Royce, airplane, health, healing, financial prosperity, clothes, furniture, churches, Bibles, television sets, television stations, television channels, television cameras. He said whatsoever, he said. Scripture clearly teaches not to have money and material possessions as the major focus or goal. That's not to say that God doesn't at times bless his people financially, but it is to say that 1. Scripture doesn't guarantee financial or material blessing for every believer. 2. Scripture attacks the idea of constantly seeking out wealth and materialism the way this movement does. And 3. Scripture doesn't teach this idea of sending in money vows or pledges to a TV preacher with the promise of receiving something in return. Gloria Copeland states, Give $10 and receive $1,000. Give $10,000 and receive $100,000. Second Peter 2 not only condemns the greed within this movement, but it also calls out those who would exploit people due to their greed, much like we see in these unbiblical telethons. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, who loved gain for wrongdoing. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved." Unquote. If people are going to help others financially or with resources, etc., they should do so without expecting anything in return, not anticipating to get rich in return. As Luke 6.35 states, quote, Lend expecting nothing in return, unquote. Plus, these Word of Faith celebrities don't need help. They're just trying to abuse wealth and trick people to make them more rich. Mark 4.18 and 19 describes those who hear the word and then, because of focus on wealth and materialism, they fall into destruction, quote, They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But I believe God with you that as you sow tonight, you're going to sow this, and you're going to reap that. Matthew 6, 19-21 Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also." Unquote. Therefore, it is erroneous for the Word of Faith movement to teach people to focus on attaining finance and possession as though such things come to all believers. For example, Joyce Meyer's comments where she states, quote, If you stay in your faith, you are going to get paid. I am now living in my reward. Unquote. New Testament scholar Gordon Fee argues that there is a major carefree attitude towards wealth and material prosperity in the New Testament, quote, This carefree attitude toward wealth and possessions, for which neither prosperity nor poverty is value, is thoroughgoing in the New Testament. According to Jesus, the good news of the inbreaking of the kingdom frees us from all of those pagan concerns. The one with two tunics should share with him who has none. Possessions are to be sold and given to the poor. But if one does not have possessions, he is not to seek them. God cares for one's needs. The extras are unnecessary. The rich man who seeks more and more is a fool. Life does not consist in having a surplus of possessions." Unquote. With respect to the question, was the influential Apostle Paul wealthy or a seeker of material wealth, Fee states, quote, The same carefree attitude toward health and possessions also marks all of Paul. He is a free man in Christ who knows contentment whatever the circumstances. He knows both want and plenty, both hunger and being well fed. He can do all things, which in this context clearly refers to being in need, through Christ who gives him strength. He thus tells those who have nothing to be content with food and clothing. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap. But then he remembers those who happen to be rich. 
They are to treat their wealth with indifference. They must not put any stock in it. Rather, they are to be generous and willing to share, for this is true wealth. The point is, in the new age, prosperity is simply no value at all." Unquote. As 1 Corinthians 4, 9-13 makes clear, quote, For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we are in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst, we are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled we bless, when persecuted we endure, when slandered we entreat. We have become, and are still, like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I was teaching some young men the other day and I was teaching them about the power of a thought. You are one thought away from a great reformation in your life. One thought away from being a billionaire. One common false assertion made is that Jesus and the disciples were rich. In a Newsday article entitled Prosperity Gospel Bringing in the Cash, Martin C. Evan writes, quote, Dollar says biblical descriptions of Jesus' crucifixion. One says soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice shows that Jesus must have been wealthy enough to have worn fine garments. When you go to the scriptures, there is no way you can conclude Jesus was poor." Unquote. However, there is nothing in the texts, i.e. Matthew 27.35, Mark 15.24, Luke 23.34, or John 19.24, which say the reason lots were cast for Jesus' clothes by the executioners was because he was rich. Any good commentary will explain it was a common custom for the clothes of the victim to be taken by the executioners. This was even prophesied to happen in Psalms 22:18. John 19:23-24 shows us that there were four soldiers at the cross. It says they divided Christ's clothes among themselves and then gambled or casted lots for the tunic, the fifth item. Hence, the evidence shows lots were not cast because Jesus' tunic was anything special or a designer brand. The reason it was gambled for was because his first four items of clothing, i.e. probably common sandals, an inner and outer garment, and a belt, could be divided among four soldiers. But the fifth item, i.e. the tunic, couldn't be. That's why it was gambled for. Hence, there's nothing in these texts indicating Christ was wealthy or that there was anything overly special about his clothing. Luke 9.58 indicates Jesus was not a wealthy man. It states, quote, and Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head." Unquote. In fact, Jesus clearly spoke out against the thinking of this movement when in Luke 12, 15 he stated, quote, And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Unquote. Another common deception in this movement is the teaching that Jesus died on the cross to make us wealthy and healthy. Joyce Meyer, along with others, distorts Isaiah 53.5 which says, quote, By his stripes we are healed, unquote. And 1 Peter 2.24 which says, quote, By his wounds you have been healed. Joyce Meyer states, By his stripes I was healed. Healing belongs to me. I was healed 2,000 years ago by the stripes Jesus bore. I'm not trying to get healing, I've already got my healing." Unquote. Commenting on this text, Gloria Copeland remarks, So when sickness starts to come on your body, don't think of yourself as the sick trying to get healed. You are the healed, and the devil is trying to steal your health." Unquote. But never saw prosperity until I learned the third place that Jesus shed his blood, to break the curse of poverty. But that's why it says, He became poor that you might become come rich. On. When Isaiah 53.5 says, by his stripes we are healed, the context is substitutionary atonement for sin, not securing of literal physical healing. Verses 4 and 5 state, quote, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed, unquote. Thus, the context shows that by his stripes we are healed is synonymous with saying he was wounded for our sin and thus takes care of our sin by healing us spiritually, since sin causes us to be separated from God and thus spiritually marred or sick. As Old Testament scholar Jeffrey W. Grogan notes in his commentary on Isaiah, quote, Peace and healing view sin in terms of the estrangement from God 
and the marring of the sinner himself that it causes." Unquote. Thus, contextually, there is nothing about Jesus' crucifixion purchasing our physical healing or wealth, etc. With respect to 1 Peter 2.24, it states, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed." Unquote. Noting 1 Peter 2's allusion to Isaiah 53, Dr. Gordon Fee provides some important information. Quote, Peter says, He himself bore our sins, that we might die to sin. He then goes on, By his wounds you have been healed, for you were as sheep going astray. The allusion to both verse 5 and 6, joined by 4 and referring to sheep going astray, plus the change to the past tense, all make it abundantly clear that healing here is a metaphor for being restored to health from the sickness of their sins. Such a metaphorical usage would be natural for Peter since sin as wound, injury, or sickness, and the healing of such sickness, are thoroughgoing images in the Old Testament. Thus, these texts do not support the Word of Faith movement when understood correctly. Now, this movement will constantly appeal to John 14.14 which says, If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. They interpret this to mean God will just give them their temptations, wealth, and things of this nature at the snap of a finger. However, again, the context is so important. The quote-unquote anything Christ mentions pertains to enabling the disciples to do miraculous works having to do with spreading the gospel by the power of the Spirit in order to glorify God not them receiving their desires such as wealth, etc. John 14, 12-17 states, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and will be in you." Unquote. Thus, clearly, this has nothing whatsoever to do with asking God for a new car or mansion. This is a promise from Jesus to the disciples regarding them being able to do holy works for the kingdom once Christ is gone. In that sense, or in that regard, anything that they were to ask Jesus for would be granted to them through the Holy Spirit. And we see this in the book of Acts. Although the disciples were persecuted and killed, when they sought to do a miracle, God gave them the power to do it. That God will not grant requests of greed, but only ones consistent with his character and word, is evident in 1 John 5.14, quote, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, unquote. It is dangerous to take a verse out of context or create a theology based on such distortions. Commenting on this text, the great reformer John Calvin wrote, quote, For though God has promised to do whatsoever his people may ask, yet he does not allow them an unbridled liberty to ask whatever may come to their minds. But he has at the same time prescribed to them a law according to which they are to pray. And doubtless nothing is better for us than this restriction. For if it was allowed to every one of us to ask what he pleased, and if God were to indulge us in our wishes, it would be to provide very badly for us. For what may be expedient we know not. Nay, we boil over with corrupt and hurtful desires. But God supplies a twofold remedy, lest we should pray otherwise than according to what his own will has prescribed. For he teaches us by his word what he would have us to ask. And he has also set over us his spirit as our guide and ruler to restrain our feelings so as not to suffer them to wander beyond due bounds. Romans 8.26 Another text this movement distorts is Jeremiah 29.11 which states, For I know what I have planned for you, says the Lord. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you. I have plans to give you a future filled with hope. Unquote. This text is presented as if it applies to every person or every Christian, and that God is saying this universally with respect to finance, etc. However, this is actually from a letter in the book of Jeremiah, from Jeremiah the prophet to Jews who Nebuchadnezzar exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem, verse 1. God promised to restore them and bring them back to their homeland and out of captivity if they repent. The exhortation is not to listen to the false prophets exiled with them, who said there would be a fast restoration, God's promise was a restoration in 70 years, verses 8 to 12, 
So the context doesn't concern every person or Christian. The context is a Jewish restoration from Babylonian captivity 70 years after the time this letter was written by Jeremiah. Another misused text is 3 John 2 which says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth." Unquote. Commenting on this text, Bruce Barron stated, quote, The Copelands use these words so often that they appear to be the key verse of their ministry. Unquote. However, regarding 3 John 2, many have noted that wishing for prosperity or things to go well and for good health was the standard form of greeting in a personal letter, similar to how today we say, Dear Mrs. Smith, I hope you are doing well. Studies have been done on ancient personal letters at that time which bear this out. See Gordon Fee, The Disease of the Health and Wealth Gospel, page 10. Secondly, John was speaking to an elder named Gaius, who was afflicted, not every Christian. So there is nothing here supporting the Word of Faith movement's view that every believer is promised health and wealth. Thus, when Copeland says, quote, John writes that we should prosper and be in health, unquote. He is fabricating and erroneously trying to justify his teachings of greed and worldliness. Another text which is commonly abused by proponents of this false system is Mark 10, 29-30, which states, quote, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life." Unquote. It is argued that this text affirms every believer will receive prosperity such as nice houses and land, etc. However, what this verse is teaching is that, though in the midst of persecution, the first century community-oriented believers would lose everything for the sake of the gospel, and yet be able to share the homes of other believers, their land, and have spiritual relationships in place of the families they lost due to being Christians. However, today we don't live in times of messianic communities, and so to extend many of these specific promises to people beyond the time when such messianic communities existed is inappropriate. Second, the Word of Faith view doesn't take into account some important facts. As Dr. Ben Witherington III notes, quote, It is of course very unlikely that Jesus is enunciating here a get-rich-quick through Christian sacrifice schema. The list of persons and things he offers is very revealing about ancient social values. Relatives and basic property, house and land, were the very basis of survival and existence. To cut oneself off from all family and property was to endanger one's very existence." Unquote. Thus, this text shouldn't be used to bolster excessive prosperity or anything of that nature, which is what the Word of Faith movement does when abusing these kinds of texts. A text which is misused to bolster the thought power doctrine, i.e. the teaching that one can receive health and wealth with thoughts or words and declarations, is a mistranslation of Proverbs 23.7. In a 2011 article entitled, You Are What You Think, in Charisma Magazine, Joyce Meyer quotes the Amplified Bible Translation, quote, Because my thoughts were all negative, my talk and my life were too. Proverbs 23.7 says that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. My life was a reflection of my thoughts and my words, unquote. This mistranslation of this text is commonly abused by people in the Word of Faith movement. However, the literal verse doesn't say, as a man thinks in his heart, so does he become. The context is about any corrupt king, generally, and how although when you eat with a king of this nature, he will feed you, but inwardly he is calculating the cost or thinking in his heart how much your eating of his food is costing him. Here's the context and notice how many of the themes, such as not seeking to acquire wealth in verse 4, contradict the word of faith movement. Proverbs 23, 1-7, quote, When you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you possess a large appetite. Do not crave that ruler's delicacies, for that food is deceptive. Do not wear yourself out to become rich. Be wise enough to restrain yourself. When you gaze upon riches, they are gone, for they surely make wings for themselves, and fly off into the sky like an eagle. Do not eat the food of a stingy person, do not crave his delicacies, for he is like someone calculating the cost in his mind, eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you." Unquote. 
Hence, not only is their amplified translation of verse 7 and their abuse of that translation erroneous, not supporting their thought power doctrine at all, but the context actually condemns the Word of Faith movement when verse 4 says not to seek to become rich. The fact is, they are distorting the text based on a non-literal translation. It is claimed by this movement that Proverbs 18.21 also supports thought power and seeking wealth and things of this nature. For example, in Joel Osteen's 2012 book of magic spells entitled, I Declare, 31 Promises to Speak Over Your Life, he states, quote, Proverbs 18.21 says, Life and death are in the power of our tongue. What are you saying about your future? What are you saying about your finances? Make sure the words you are sending out are in the direction you want your life to go." Unquote. However, this text isn't teaching anything about declaring health and wealth into existence, or thinking and speaking a thing, making it come to pass, such as finance, etc. It's simply talking about being careful about negative consequences of what one says, as verses 6 and 7 shortly before state, quote, A fool's lips walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. A fool's mouth is his ruin, and his lips are a snare to his soul." Unquote. And to make matters even worse, a few verses earlier in verse 11, relying on and trusting in wealth is condemned. Quote, a rich man's wealth is his strong city, and like a high wall in his imagination. Unquote. Which is the very thing these celebrity word of faith teachers do. To distort Proverbs 18.21 as if it teaches speaking wealth into existence, is a great example of reading modern word of faith heresy into the text when it's not actually there. Now, the next text is probably the most misused by this movement. Mark 11, 24 states, And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses." Unquote. A few points here. First, Jesus is teaching on the power of believing prayer to God. Not as many of the Word of Faith movement teach, thought power or declarative power removed from total reliance on God. Second, there is nothing here indicating that the power of prayer here concerns praying for luxury and things of this nature. Rather, the context concerns praying for holy Christian things. Verse 25 mentions forgiving others in your prayer and being forgiven yourself. And we learned from 1 John 5.14, Christians are to pray for things which are in conformity to God's pure will, not for unnecessary luxuries and temptations which the New Testament over and over says not to seek. Thirdly, verse 22 says have faith or trust in God when praying, and that is the sense in which one is to believe their prayer will come to pass without doubting. God is the object of trust here. It does not say, as this movement does, believe in and trust in your own words or thoughts, as though those things are the object of our trust. Thus, this text doesn't teach the power of thought or the power of human declaration, but instead the power of God when one prays for godly things while trusting in Him. The Word of Faith movement's teaching is man-centered and man-glorifying. The biblical teaching on the power of prayer is God-centered and God-glorifying. Realizing this text doesn't actually support their speaking things into existence doctrine where they emphasize trust or believing in their own thoughts and declarations, many Word of Faith teachers have sought to then mistranslate Mark 11.22 as have the faith of God instead of have faith in God. This gives room to teach people to have faith in their own declarations. For example, in his book New Thresholds of Faith, Kenneth Hagin falsely asserted that verse 22 should be translated as, quote, have the God kind of faith, unquote. However, New Testament scholar C.E.B. Cranfield, an expert in the original Greek, has noted in his commentary on Mark that such a view is, quote, surely a monstrosity of exegesis, unquote. It should be taken as an objective genitive, where God is the object of faith, i.e. faith in God. This is how all major translations done by responsible committees translate the verse. These people commit the same error regarding Hebrews 11.3 which says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, unquote. They claim this supports God having faith. But again, this isn't talking about the faith of God, but our faith in God. 
or our faith that God created the universe by his word or command. We can know this for certain since verse 1 and verse 3b speak of our faith in things not seen. That's the context. Thus, God creating the universe in the past is something we have not seen, yet despite that we have faith in it. That's the point. Therefore, there's no room for mistranslating this to mean faith of God or humans having the faith of God. Yet this doesn't stop proponents of this movement from teaching people to trust in their own faith or abilities. As is clear, this movement's teachings are based on lies and deceptions. Lastly, in attempting to justify their greedy lifestyles, these people actually claim being poor is a sin. For example, Tilton states, That's the Bible! That's the word of God. There is prosperity. Not only is worrying a sin, but being poor is a sin when God promises prosperity. D.R. McConnell's excellent work, A Different Gospel, which details the history of this movement, will be helpful for this section, as will Jones's and Woodbridge's work, Health, Wealth, and Happiness. Now, since scripture does not teach these word of faith doctrines we have covered, and yet we can see they're believed in by this movement, it must be asked, why does this movement and its distinctive doctrines even exist? Who is responsible for this movement and its distinctive teachings? The answers to these questions are very revealing insofar as the hidden, dark nature of this movement is concerned. We have shown that Kenneth Hagin is the grandfather of this movement. Many modern teachers in this movement quote him in their material, call him Daddy Hagin, and have done appearances with him teaching the same things as him. The death of Kenneth Hagin ended a season and began another season. Kenneth Hagin's son, Hagin Jr., notes Kenneth Copeland's relationship with his dad, quote, a poverty-stricken student from Oral Roberts University attended my father's Tulsa seminars in the mid-60s and got turned on to the Word of God. The student was deeply in debt, but he desperately wanted my father's tapes. He offered to trade the title to his car for them. Buddy Harrison, my brother-in-law, was managing the ministry then. He took one look at the old car and told him, just go ahead and take the tapes. Bring the money when you can. So young Kenneth Copeland memorized those tapes and another great ministry was launched. Moreover, Joel Osteen's father, John Osteen, stated, quote, I think Brother Hagen is chosen of God and stands in the forefront of the message of faith, unquote. The distinctive teachings of this movement again include the little God's doctrine, declaring things into existence like a little God, Jesus being a mere man on earth, Jesus being born again in hell, the emphasis on material gain and greed, and the alleged insufficiency of Christ's atonement on the cross. So the question becomes, from where did Granddaddy Hagen get these beliefs, which he would then hand on to the next generation of Word of Faith teachers like Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, Fred Price, Paul Crouch, Joyce Meyer, Creflo Dollar, and Joel Osteen, etc.? And who else before Hagen taught these distinctive doctrines which have now infiltrated Christianity? Distinguished Professor of Comparative Religion and American Studies at Miami University, Oxford, Ohio, Dr. Peter W. Williams has, in his comprehensive survey of religious movements and denominations, noted, quote, This movement arose with the teachings of E. W. Kenyon in New England in the early part of the 20th century and was popularized by Oklahoma Pentecostal Kenneth Hagin. Central to this movement is the practice of positive confession. The best known exponents of this doctrine are the televangelists Jan and Paul Crouch, who preside over the far-flung Trinity Broadcasting Network, TBN. As Williams noted there, it is well known that granddaddy Kenneth Hagin got his teachings from a man who he studied named E.W. Kenyon. In this film, we will explore the Kenyon Hagen connection, since it is the most important and revealing. That Daddy Hagen was a student of and got his teachings from E.W. Kenyon is evidenced by many things. Firstly, Hagen has explicitly admitted that he got teachings from Kenyon. 
In his preface to his book, The Name of Jesus, Hagen stated, quote, At the time, 1978, I had one sermon I preached on this wonderful subject, but I had never really taught on it at length. I was amazed how little material there is in print on this subject. The only good book devoted entirely to it that I found was E. W. Kenyon's The Wonderful Name of Jesus. I encourage you to get a copy. It is a marvelous book. It is revelation knowledge. It is the Word of God." Unquote. Secondly, in McConnell's work A Different Gospel, he documented how Hagen would plagiarize from Kenyon's writings word for word in his own books. McConnell provides pages of column-by-column -column quotes from both Hagen and Kenyon, proving beyond question that Hagen plagiarized from Kenyon's books. In fact, this plagiarism was so bad, Kenyon's own daughter, Ruth Kenyon Houseworth, stated this concerning the Word of Faith teachers like Hagen. They've, the faith teachers, all copied from my dad, E.W. Kenyon. They've changed it a little bit and added their own touch, but they couldn't change the wording. The Lord gave him, Kenyon, words and phrases. He coined them. They can't put it in any other words." Unquote. And, quote, His Kenyon's first book was printed in 1916, and he had received revelation knowledge before that. These that are coming along now have been in the ministry for just a few years, and claiming that this is something that they are just starting, it makes you laugh a little bit. It's very difficult for some people to be big enough to give credit to somebody else." Unquote. Contra Houseworth, Kenyon did not receive revelation knowledge from God as we will show. He was in fact a cultist. But what's important is, not only was Hagen a dishonest plagiarist scammer making money off of other people's writings, but he claimed to receive the contents of his writings through revelation knowledge. See A Different Gospel, Chapter 4, where it's documented that Hagen claimed to get his teaching through revelation and divine visitations. One example where Hagen claimed to receive revelation, thus claiming to be a prophet, is where he wrote, quote, Then the Lord said this to me, which is not just for my benefit, but for yours. If you will learn to follow the inward witness, I will make you rich. I am not opposed to my children being rich." Unquote. However, Hagen's teachings were not his revelation knowledge, despite his repeated claims. They were, in fact, Kenyon's thoughts, which he plagiarized most of the time. Thus, it's clear, Hagen, one of the original Word of Faith leaders after Kenyon, did not care about deceiving all the people who followed him in order to convince them he was a prophet of God with divinely received teaching. The warning in Jeremiah 14.14 14 comes to mind, quote, And the Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds, unquote. Thirdly, we can see Hagen's and Kenyon's teaching are the same when it comes to revelational knowledge, speaking things into existence, humans being little gods, Jesus suffering in hell and being born again, etc. For example, like Hagen, Kenyon first taught Jesus suffered in hell and that his blood atonement on the cross was insufficient, quote, If his physical death paid it, then every man could die for himself, unquote. Moreover, Kenyon taught, quote, when Jesus died, his spirit was taken by the adversary and carried to the place where the sinner's spirit goes when it dies." Unquote. And after Jesus' alleged spiritual death and becoming united to Satan in nature, quote, Jesus was born again before he was raised from the dead. Unquote. Lastly, Kenyon, like Hagen after him, taught, quote, What I confess, I possess. Unquote. So it's clear this is where Hagen got his teaching, and subsequently where Copeland's, Hins, Crouch's, Myers, Price's, Dollars, Osteen's, and all the others' teachings have historical recourse too. Now it must be asked, who was E. W. Kenyon? If it can be shown that this man was a satanic heretic who was deeply rooted in cultic movements, then that means the origins of this Word of Faith movement are severely corrupted, more so than is already apparent. And as Matthew 7:18 states, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit." Unquote. That Kenyon, the real founder of this movement, was an unreliable, satanic heretic is clear from many considerations. First, it's been shown by McConnell and others that in 1892, Kenyon attended the Emerson School of Oratory in Boston, which had Charles Emerson as president. 
Emerson being a proponent of transcendentalism, new thought, and the cultic teachings of the Christian science movement founded by Mary Baker Eddy, which taught only spiritual reality is true and everything else is an illusion, and that the Christian view of atonement is erroneous. Now, this school Kenyon attended had the metaphysical cultic New Thought doctrines flourishing in it. New Thought originated largely by Phineas Quimby, being the teaching that the spiritual realm transcends the physical realm, and that thought power and positive thinking are true, i.e., that sickness comes from the mind, and right thinking heals it, etc. This explains why Kenyon and those under him deny the physical atonement of Christ was sufficient, and that Christ needed to suffer spiritually in hell, and that speaking things into existence like health and wealth is correct. It all goes back to Christian science and the New Thought Movement's influence on Kenyon, who then influenced Hagen, who was very influential in the modern Word of Faith movement. These unbiblical movements such as Christian science and the New Thought have always been recognized as cultic and erroneous by Christianity, so it's interesting to now see their offspring, such as Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer, and Kenneth Copeland, being accepted by many people as Christians and not cultists. As McConnell notes after his historical survey on this issue, quote, Kenyon did not merely attend a school of oratory at Emerson College, but a school in which both the faculty and student body were heavily involved with the metaphysical cults." Unquote. Now that we have seen that the major teachings of the Word Faith Movement are erroneous, it is our prayer that those who listen to the people critiqued in this film will separate from them and their doctrine. We pray that people will repent and trust in the person and sufficient work of Christ on the cross for salvation and really get into Holy Scripture alone, living after God. One may think following after these false teachers is not a serious damnable sin, but according to Ezekiel 14.10, with respect to following after false prophets, quote, And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him, unquote. Don't be bound to your traditions. You're watching me at home. You ministers, check it out with the world. Don't think I'm teaching something that's some crazy stuff, you know?